convictions of the crime of first degree murder. To prove the crime of first degree premeditated murder, the state must prove the following three elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Number one, Daniel Markell is dead. Number two, the death was caused by the criminal act of the defendant. Number three, there was a premeditated killing of Daniel Markell. An act includes a series of related actions arising from and performed pursuant to a single design or purpose. Killing with premeditation is killing after consciously deciding to do so. The decision must be present in the mind at the time of the killing. The law does not fix the exact period of time that must pass between the formation of the premeditated intent to kill and the killing. The period of time must be long enough to allow reflection by the defendant. The premeditated intent to kill must be formed before the killing. The question of premeditation is a question of fact to be determined by you from the evidence. It will be sufficient proof of premeditation if the circumstances of the killing and the conduct of the accused convince you beyond a reasonable doubt of the existence of premeditation at the time of the killing. When there are lesser included crimes. In considering the evidence, you should consider the possibility that although the evidence may not convince you that the defendant committed the main crime of which he or she is accused, there may be evidence that he or she committed other acts that would constitute a lesser included crime. Therefore, if you decide that the main accusation has not been proved beyond a reasonable doubt, you will next need to decide if defendant is guilty of any lesser included crime. The lesser crimes indicated in the definition of first degree murder are second degree murder and manslaughter. Second degree murder. To prove the crime of second degree murder, the state must prove the following three elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Number one, Daniel Markell is dead. Number two, the death was caused by the criminal act of the defendant. Number three, there was an unlawful killing of Daniel Markell by an act imminently dangerous to another and demonstrating a depraved mind without regard for human life. An act includes a series of related actions arising from and performed pursuant to a single design or purpose. An act is imminently dangerous to another and demonstrating a depraved mind if it is an act or series of acts that, number one, a person of ordinary judgment would know is reasonably certain to kill or do serious bodily injury to another, and, number two, is done from ill will, hatred, spite, or an evil intent, and, three, is of such a nature that the act itself indicates an indifference to human life. In order to convict of second degree murder, it is not necessary for the state to prove the defendant had an intent to cause death. Manslaughter. To prove the crime of manslaughter, the state must prove the following two elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Number one, Daniel Markell is dead. Number two, the defendant intentionally committed an act or acts that caused the death of Daniel Markell. Every person has a duty to act reasonably towards others. If there is a violation of that duty without any conscious intention to harm, that violation is negligence. The defendant cannot be guilty of manslaughter by committing a merely negligent act, or if the killing was either justifiable or excusable homicide, as I have previously instructed you. In order to convict of manslaughter by act, it is not necessary for the state to prove that the defendant had an intent to cause death, only an intent to commit an act that was not merely negligent, justified, or excusable, and which caused death. Principles. If the defendant helped another person or persons commit a crime, the defendant is a principal and must be treated as if he or she had done all the things the other person or persons did if... Number one, the defendant had a conscious intent that the criminal act be done. And number two, the defendant did some act or said some word which was intended and which did incite, 
cause, encourage, assist, or advise the other person or persons to actually commit the crime. To be a principal under either theory, the defendant does not have to be present when the crime is committed. Principals when active participant hired by defendant. If the defendant paid or promised to pay another person or persons to commit a crime, the defendant is a principal and must be treated as if she had done all of the things the person who was promised or received the money did if, one, the defendant had a conscious intent that the criminal act be done, and two, she made or promised the payment in exchange for the commission or promised to commit the crime or to help commit the crime, and three, the crime was committed by the other person. To be a principal under either theory, the defendant does not have to be present when the crime is committed. Count two, conspiracy. In count two, Catherine D. Magbanua, the defendant in this case, has been accused of the crime of conspiracy to commit first degree murder. To prove the crime of criminal conspiracy, the state must prove the following two elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Number one, the intent of the defendant was that the offense of first degree murder would be committed. Number two, in order to carry out the intent, the defendant agreed, conspired, combined, or confederated with another person to cause first degree murder to be committed either by them or one of them or by some other person. It is not necessary that the agreement conspiracy, combination, or confederation to commit first-degree murder be expressed in any particular words or words pass between the conspirators. It is not necessary that the defendant do, do not act in furtherance of the offense conspired. Count three, solicitation. In count three, Catherine D. Magbanua, the defendant in this case, has been accused of the crime of solicitation to commit first degree murder. To prove the crime of criminal solicitation, the state must prove the following two elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Number one, the defendant solicited Sigfredo Garcia and or Luis Rivera to commit first degree murder. Number two, during the solicitation, the defendant commanded, encouraged, hired or requested Sigfredo Garcia and or Luis Rivera to engage in specific conduct which would constitute the commission of first degree murder. It is not necessary that the defendant did any act in furtherance of the offense solicited. To solicit means to ask earnestly or to try to induce another person to engage in specific conduct. Plea of not guilty, reasonable doubt, and burden of proof. The defendant has entered a plea of not guilty. This means you must presume or believe the defendant is innocent. The presumption stays with the defendant as to each material allegation in the information and indictment through each stage of the trial, unless it has been overcome by the evidence to the exclusion of and beyond to overcome the defendant's presumption of innocence, the state has the burden of proving the crimes with which the defendant is charged were committed and the defendant is the individual who committed the crimes. The defendant is not required to present evidence or prove anything. Whenever the words reasonable doubt are used, you must consider the following. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible doubt a speculative, imaginary, or forced doubt. Such a doubt must not influence you to return a verdict of not guilty if you have an abiding conviction of guilt. On the other hand, if, after carefully considering, comparing, and weighing all the evidence, there is not an abiding conviction of guilt, or if having a conviction, it is one which is not stable, but one which wavers and vacillates, then the charge is not proved beyond every reasonable doubt and you must find the defendant not guilty because the doubt is reasonable. It is to the evidence introduced in this trial and to it alone that you are to look for that proof. A reasonable doubt as to the guilt of the defendant may arise from the evidence, 
conflict in the evidence or the lack of evidence. If you have a reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant not guilty. If you have no reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant guilty. Weighing the evidence. It is up to you to decide what evidence is reliable. You should use your common sense in deciding which is the best evidence and which evidence should not be relied upon in considering your verdict. You may find some of the evidence not reliable or less reliable than other evidence. You should consider how the witness acted as well as what they said. Some things you should consider are, number one, did the witness seem to have an opportunity to see and know the things about which the witness testified? Number two, did the witness seem to have an accurate memory? Number three, was the witness honest and straightforward in answering the attorney's questions? Number four, did the witness have some interest in how the case should be decided? Number five, does the witness's testimony agree with the other testimony and other evidence in the case? Number six, has the witness been offered or received any money, preferred treatment, or other benefit in order to get the witness to testify? Number seven, had any pressure or threat been used against the witness that affected the truth of the witness's testimony? Number eight, did the witness at some other time make a statement that is inconsistent with the testimony he or she gave in court? Number nine, has the witness been convicted of a felony? Number 10, does the witness have a general reputation for dishonesty? Whether the state has met its burden of proof does not depend upon the number of witnesses it has called or upon the number of exhibits it has offered, but instead upon the nature and quality of the evidence presented. The fact that a witness is employed in law enforcement does not mean that his or her testimony deserves more or less consideration than that of any other witness. Expert witnesses are like other witnesses with one exception. The law permits an expert witness to give his or her opinion. However, an expert's opinion is reliable only when given on a subject about which you believe him or her to be an expert. Like other witnesses, you may believe or disbelieve all or any part of an expert's testimony. You must consider the testimony of some witnesses with more caution than others. For example, a witness who claims to have helped the defendant commit a crime has been promised immunity from prosecution or hopes to gain more favorable treatment in his or her own case may have a reason to make a false statement in order to strike a good bargain with the state. This is particularly true when there is no other evidence tending to agree with what the witness says about the defendant. So while a witness of that kind may be entirely truthful when testifying, you, can, you should consider his or her testimony with more caution than the testimony of other witnesses. However, if the testimony of such a witness convinces you beyond a reasonable doubt of the defendant's guilt or the other evidence in the case does so, then you should find the defendant guilty. The defendant has become a witness. You should apply the same rules to consideration of her testimony that you apply to the testimony of the other witnesses. It is entirely proper for a lawyer to talk to a witness about what testimony the witness would give if called to the courtroom. The witness should not be discredited by talking to a lawyer about his or her testimony. You may rely upon your own conclusion about the credibility of any witness. A juror may believe or disbelieve all or any part of the evidence or the testimony of any witness. Rules for deliberation. <coughs> there are some general rules that apply to your discussion. You must follow these rules in order to return a lawful verdict. Number one, you must follow the law as it is set out in these instructions. If you fail to follow the law, your verdict will be a miscarriage of justice. There is no reason for failing to follow the law in this case. All of us are depending upon you to make a wise and legal decision in this matter. Number two, this case must be decided only upon the evidence that you have heard from the testimony of the witnesses and have seen in the form of the exhibits in evidence and these instructions. Number three, 
This case must not be decided for or against anyone because you feel sorry for anyone or are angry at anyone. Number four, remember the lawyers are not on trial. Your feelings about them should not influence your decision in this case. Number five, your duty is to determine if the defendant has proven guilty, has been proven guilty or not in accord with the law. Number six, whatever verdict you render must be unanimous. That is, each juror must agree to the same verdict. Number seven, your verdict should not be influenced by feelings of prejudice, bias, or sympathy. Your verdict must be based on the evidence and on the law contained in these instructions. Cautionary instruction. Deciding a verdict is exclusively your job. I cannot participate in that decision in any way. Please disregard anything I may have said or done that made you think I preferred one verdict over another. Single defendant, multiple counts. A separate crime is charged in each count, and although they have been tried together, each crime and the evidence applicable to it must be considered separately and a separate verdict returned as to each. A finding of guilty or not guilty as to one crime must not affect your verdict as to the other crimes charged. Verdict. You may find a defendant guilty as charged or guilty of such lesser included crime as the evidence may justify or not guilty. If you return a verdict of guilty, it should be for the highest offense that has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. If you find that no offense has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, then of course, your verdict must be not guilty. The verdict must be unanimous, that is, all of you must agree to the same verdict. Only one verdict may be returned as to each crime charged. The verdict must be in writing, and for your convenience, the necessary verdict form has been prepared for you, and it reads as follows. Okay, and I have the verdict form up here, and I'm going to read it to you, and of course, this will go back to the jury room with you. <clears throat> verdict. We, the jury, find as follows as to count one. Check only one as to the letters. A, the defendant is guilty of first degree murder. Or B, the defendant is guilty of the lesser included offense of second degree murder. Or C, the defendant is guilty of the lesser included offense of manslaughter. Or D, the defendant is not guilty. We, the jury, find as follows as to count two. Check only one as to the letters. A, the defendant is guilty of conspiracy to commit first degree murder, or B, the defendant is not guilty. We, the jury, find as follows as to count three. Check only one as to the letters. A, the defendant is guilty of solicitation to commit first degree murder, or B, the defendant is not guilty, and it's signed and dated by the foreperson. All right, before I read this final instruction to you, the attorneys will now present their final arguments to you. Please remember that what the attorneys say is not evidence. However, do listen closely to their arguments. They're intended to aid you in understanding the case. Each side has been given sufficient time but the state is entitled to a rebuttal argument after the defense has presented its closing argument to you. Okay, so we start with the closing arguments at this time, and the state proceeds first. And Ms. Kappelman, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Counsel. Members of the jury, good morning. This is Dan Markell. Dan Markell is the only victim in this case. This is what he looked like before this defendant sent her friends up to see him. And this is what he looked like afterwards. The evidence has shown that on July 18th, 2014, this community suffered a tragic blow 
when this revered law professor, colleague, son, father, brother, and friend was gunned down in broad daylight in his own home. And what enemies had Dan Markell made that set his brutal fate into motion? His own family. And what offense had Mr. Markell committed against these people? Refusing to let his children be taken away from him? Objecting to them, disparaging him to his kids? What was the motive for this heinous murder? The motive is clear. It's undisputed that the divorce between Wendy Adelson and Dan Markell was a particularly nasty one. Look at State's Exhibit 59. This is their divorce file. Over 700 pages thick. They fought over everything from the education, the religious training of their children, down to a tennis racket. In January of 2013, Wendy Adelson filed a motion to allow her to relocate to South Florida with her two children, ages two and three at the time. As one basis for this request, Wendy Adelson cites that the wife's parents reside in Coral Springs and the wife's brother resides 20 minutes away. The children are very close to the wife's parents. The husband has also created a hostile work environment for the wife at the FSU School of Law. Wendy Adelson viewed herself as stuck in Tallahassee, a word used to describe her situation by Jeffrey Lacoste on the witness stand the other day and also mentioned in her pleadings on page 152 of that exhibit. In Markell's answer, he seeks continued equal time sharing in Tallahassee. He seeks sole parental responsibility on issues related to the education, religion, and medical upbringing of these children. Markell's dedication to these kids, especially in these areas, is undisputed. He was devout in his beliefs and felt strongly that his boys should be raised in an environment that observed the Jewish traditions and he was committed to the Jewish faith, a fact that was exploited by Donna Adelson, who suggested that Wendy could threaten to convert her boys to Catholicism in an effort to try to bully Markell into agreeing to the relocation. She also suggested that she and Harvey Adelson and Charlie Adelson would chip in on a million dollar bribe to buy Markell's agreement to this move. What a bargain they ended up getting to solve this problem for only $100,000. Consider the venom in the emails that Donna Adelson wrote to Wendy referring to Dan Markell as an asshole, a bastard, a religious zealot, and much more a sentiment that continued to fester and grow within that family when on June 20th, 2013, a judge entered an order denying Wendy Adelson's motion for relocation. This is the summer of 2013, the time frame in which Charlie Adelson began looking into all options to resolve his sister's relocation problem, including hiring a hitman to kill Dan Markell. The divorce was final on July 31st, 2013, but the anger and bitterness continued, even increasing. Litigation continued as both parties filed motions alleging that the other was in violation of the marital settlement agreement. Then on March 26, 2014, less than four months prior to his murder, Dan Markell files his counter motion for enforcement of MSA on parenting issues and motion for contempt and sanctions, again alleging that Wendy Adelson was failing to facilitate communication between him and the kids and that Donna Adelson was disparaging him. He alleges on that motion that in three separate occasions on November of in November of 2013, the kids informed him that their grandmother, Donna Adelson, was saying things like, Grandma says you're stupid. She says you're trying to take her sunshines away from her, and Grandma hates you. Dan Markell requests the court to enjoin the former wife from allowing the maternal grandmother to have unsupervised time with the children and to impose appropriate limitations to safeguard the children from being subjected to disparaging comments about their father. And as we know, 
this was an issue. I mean, this is a hot button. Grandma can't have access to the kids unsupervised if this thing gets granted. But we know it never got decided. It never got litigated because Dan Markell was murdered before the hearing. So back in the summer of 2013, when Wendy Adelson's motion for relocation was initially denied, Charlie Adelson looked into having Dan Markell killed. But as the defense correctly points out, Charlie Adelson didn't even know Kathleen Magdanoa back in 2013. And hence, the murder did not happen back in 2013. The murder did not happen until Catherine Magbanawa came into the picture. The murder did not happen until Catherine Magbanawa made it happen. And what about the timing of when Wendy Adelson stood in the kitchen and told Jeffrey Lacoste, can I tell you something in confidence? Uh, my brother did seriously look into having Dan Markell killed. That statement was made in 2014, just five days before Dan Markell was murdered by a hitman. So the seed for this conspiracy was planted when Charlie Adelson began looking into committing the murder in the summer of 2013, after the judge ruled against Wendy's relocation, and it continued to grow in all efforts to coerce and bully Dan Markell into permitting this relocation failed. Then it further festered with this motion to have no contact with grandma unsupervised. And as Wendy relayed to Jeffrey Lacoste just five days before the murder, she was never going to be able to resolve this problem unless something happened to Danny. But this conspiracy took root when Charlie Adelson met somebody that could get it done. Someone who was in the posi a position of trust in his life. A person that was his girlfriend, this defendant. And Catherine Magbanoa had ties to the kind of people who were willing and able to walk up to a complete stranger and point a gun at his head and pull the trigger twice. And guess what wasn't a problem once Dan Markell was gone? Relocation. A couple days after the murder, Wendy Adelson and her boys are living within walking distance from the Adelson residence at the Icon. Their names were changed from Markell to Adelson. And just like that, their father was erased from their lives, two and three years old. No more fights over kosher diets, no more squabbles over marital assets, and no more Dan Markell. And they might have gotten away with it if it wasn't for Mr. Geiger, who bothered to be a good neighbor on July 18, 2014, and investigate a situation that was really none of his business because something just didn't seem right. His description of that Prius was critical to this investigation, that identification of that suspect vehicle, a Prius that would later be detected following Dan Markell earlier that day at the gym. They might have gotten away with it if not for the tireless efforts of law enforcement to cull through the mountains of records and data that were collected in this case, really just looking for needles in a haystack. And they found a few. For example, they found Sigfredo Garcia's phone number amongst the hundreds of numbers present at or near the gym that day. They cross-referenced that number with all the call detail records collected from all the Adelsons, which bore a single hit. A call from Sigfredo Garcia to Harvey Adelson on July 1st, 2014. An ill-fated attempt to confront who Garcia thought was his wife's new boyfriend, but who turned out to be the dad of the boyfriend. He got the wrong Dr. Adelson and left a nasty message on the dad's cell phone, causing much embarrassment to this defendant. That was on July 1st, 2014. Another needle in the haystack example is the tracking of Garcia and Rivera's cell phones to particular toll booths at particular times to locate one particular sun pass attached to one particular Prius, which led to a rental contract bearing information implicating both Luis Rivera and Sigfredo Garcia. A third example is tracking down the rental car contract for the first trip and being able to track this defendant's phone to the rental car place at the same time that that car is being rented out by the airport. 
And we discussed in jury selection that although you will not be asked to decide the guilt of anyone other than this defendant, it's going to be necessary for you to understand the roles of each person that's involved and each player that's involved in this case in order to understand how it is that this defendant fits into this conspiracy. And we get to her through these people in two ways or by, down, by two different paths. Path one, the Prius. The Prius led Garcia to Garcia and Rivera and those two led to McBanawa. Notice how we get it right in reference to Garcia. We get it right in reference to Rivera. We get it right in reference to Charlie Adelson. And you've heard quite a lot about the government's theory. They call us the government because nobody likes the government. And per the defense, our theory is completely correct in all regards except for one. We got it all right except for her. Got it wrong on her. Everything is not as it appears when it comes to her. And the defense has characterized this investigation as biased. Luis Rivera and Jessica Rodriguez are liars. The cops and prosecutors are all crooked. But please remember that what the lawyers say is not evidence. You must look to the evidence alone in deciding your verdict. And what the evidence has shown is that we had a law enforcement team that had a lot of work to do with a lot of details and a lot of pieces that we had to sort of try to distill for you into one cognizable presentation. And that's what we've attempted to do. The law enforcement team managed to pull a single Prius out of a haystack of Priuses and tie it to two men, one of whom is the defendant's uh, children's father and the other of whom took the witness stand and told you that she's the mastermind behind this whole thing. The second path this investigation took was the motive, who wanted to kill Dan Markell, the ex-wife and the in-laws, hated his guts, and are also connected to this defendant, the woman who knew people who could get a thing like this done. This is the defendant's day in court, and we talked at jury selection about the importance of focusing on her and her role. I know that's been hard to do because the proceedings sometimes felt like we were talking about other people the whole time. And I encourage you to consider the fact that it's easy to point at an empty chair. It's easy to pile on to bad actors when those folks are not represented in court. And I think one of the lawyers pointed out, oh, their lawyers are out there in the audience watching. And you know, it suits the defendant's purposes in this trial to pile on to everybody else. Everybody else is guilty, 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 guilty. That one did it, that one did it, but not me. I don't know anything. You better believe that when it is time for one of those other actors to be tried in court, It'll be a dog fight just like it was here, except it'll be, she's guilty. I'm not guilty. I didn't do anything. She acted on her own. All I did was make a, a joke, and she went and hauled off and hired a hitman. So let's review what we can agree on in this case. We got it right that the motive for killing Dan Markell was for the benefit of Wendy Adelson. We got it right that the in-laws were desperate to move her to South Florida and had the money and the audacity to actually do this kind of thing. We got it right that Charlie paid with his stapled money. And we got it right that Luis Rivera and Sofredo Garcia were paid to kill Dan Markell. It's natural for you to find yourself wondering, you know, what's going on with all these other people? You know, it's okay, it's natural, it's human for you to have feelings and emotions about the case, the people involved, the lawyers involved. You can think Luis Rivera should not have gotten a deal, or Luis Rivera's deal was too great. You can think other people should be arrested, other people should be prosecuted. It's, that's fine. You just have to separate those emotions out and weigh your verdict, base your verdict solely on the evidence in this case against this defendant. As we talked about in jury selection, you're asked to make a wise and legal decision solely about her role in this. Was this crime committed? And was she one of the people that committed this crime? Anyone else is for another day and another jury. But you just can't talk about the case without talking about all of them. It's the Adelsons that had a motive to get this murder done so that Wendy could move. You will not be asked to decide about them, but the evidence is clear 
that the thing was ultimately done for Wendy. Sigfredo Garcia and Luis Rivera were told that it was for Wendy. They believed they were doing it for Wendy. Possibly, because that's true, I mean, ultimately it was for <laughs> Wendy, but also possibly because the person that hired them, this defendant, was walling Charlie off from them. Walling Sigfredo off from knowing that the money was coming from Charlie, the boyfriend, the dentist. The TV is the first piece of code that we hear in this case. Charlie Adelson got Wendy a TV as a divorce present, as a cheaper alternative to hiring a hitman. Then the same TV is her alibi for the murder, a service appointment that her mother set up for her from South Florida, or at least there's some indication of that. And then on the wire, when Donna Adelson is speaking in code in that first call, weird thing to do after being approached by a, an alleged gangster, she says this TV is going to cost about five, referring to the $5,000 on the note that the undercover handed her. It's obvious they're referring to their conspiracy and hearkening back to this TV as code for the murder of Dan Markell. The players in this case are very smart. The crime in this case was given a lot of thought and preparation. We know that the seed was planted for this thing almost a year or more before it came to fruition. They thought of everything, a clever TV-related alibi for Wendy, a frame job for Lacoste, bullet bourbon, and they insulated themselves by hiring this defendant as a middleman between them, the ones that wanted it done, and the shooters. Everyone on the board in this case had some limits to their knowledge. And that was really smart. That made this case much harder to break. But don't let the way that they thought they would get away with this case be the way they get away with this case. Let's talk about Luis Rivera. The defense seeks to discredit his testimony as an extremely bad dude. He's you know, got the status as a felon and a gang member, and those are things you should definitely consider when you're weighing the credibility of a witness. But please consider that his resume as a bad guy is precisely why he was selected by the other parties to do this thing. I did not um, hire him to be a part of this case. I didn't hire him to be a witness, and wouldn't have if I had a choice. Um, that was done by this defendant. This defendant and her husband selected Luis Rivera to be a part of this gruesome job. Rivera's not my friend from childhood. Um, he's not the guy that my husband spends all his time with. He's not the person that I hired to do a murder. I did not choose him. But Rivera is here because he was willing to cooperate, willing to cut a sweet deal to tell the truth. He had one job, tell the truth. That's all he has to do. You know, he was chosen not only because he's got the right credentials with his gang status and his felon status, and, you know, he's also trusted. He is a lifelong friend of Sigfredo Garcia, and they didn't think he would roll. They didn't think he would talk. They thought he could be trusted. His gang status comes with a code of silence that made him more attractive as a candidate to do this murder with Sigfredo Garcia. And according to the defense, he got this amazing deal of the century to give testimony that I or someone else spoon-fed to him. First, there is no evidence of this. To the contrary, Rivera denies it. All the law enforcement involved has denied it. And with his limited ability to read, you must ask yourself if you even think it's reasonable that he could study the materials. I mean, y'all have seen what this case is like and provide some kind of fake regurgitated frame job on Catherine Magdanawa. And also have the wherewithal to pepper in details that could later be verified. Second, if it's true that I or the law enforcement on the case are so unethical, so desperate to try this case a couple more times, that we were willing to risk our careers and suborn perjury, um, why on earth didn't we just spoon feed him all the names on this? this? poster so that we could just 
you know, get on with it. The actual only condition of his cooperation deal, the sole thing he had to do was tell the truth, cooperate. Nobody put a name in his mouth. Nobody told him what to say. In jury selection, we talked about all the different types of evidence. And you each agreed to keep an open mind to all kinds of evidence. So how do you judge the credibility of a bad dude like Luis Rivera? This particular bad dude has now given 10 statements in this case over a six year period about events that happened eight years ago. So there's going to be inconsistencies. You have to evaluate the inconsistencies and say, is this an important one or not? Does this create a reasonable doubt or not? And only you can do that. Ask yourself if he was honest and straightforward in answering the attorney's questions. Compare that to Catherine McBanwell's testimony. Ask yourself if he seemed to have an accurate memory about the things he was testifying to, and compare that to Catherine McDaniel's testimony in this case. How could he have known about the shot fired through the passenger floorboard of the Prius? Because he was there, and he saw it. The fact is, that wasn't in any police report. That wasn't in any 2020. And how could he have known that Dan Markell was scheduled to leave town the next day? the day after the murder, a fact that Wendy Adelson confirmed because the defendant told him that wasn't in any police report, that wasn't on 2020. They were told they had to get it done for that reason. Y'all got to get it done today because he's going out of town tomorrow. Rivera testified that the defendant hired Sigfredo Garcia to kill Dan Markell and that Sigfredo Garcia hired him to assist in the murder. And defendant was responsible for what? Getting the money and paying them when the job was done. And Jessica Rodriguez further confirmed that defendant was involved in the money drop. She said to Sigfredo Garcia, did you give him the package? According to Jessica Rodriguez, this defendant acknowledged that package. Said to Garcia, did you give it to him? Jessica was nosy and wanted to know what was in there. Defendant says, I don't know. But the defendant's not interested. Jessica assumed it was drugs. Why wasn't the defendant interested in knowing what was in there? She's so anti-drug. And they're dropping off this suspicious package for Luis Rivera that you know she's not interested in knowing what or talking about what's in there. So these are examples of direct evidence, the testimony of Jessica Rodriguez, the testimony of Luis Rivera. But you must also consider Luis Rivera's testimony in light of all the other evidence in the case. The phone evidence is consistent with Rivera's testimony. The phone evidence ties both Garcia and Rivera to the murder trip and further evidences Catherine Magdanoa as the middleman between the killers and the Adelsons. All right, so let's go to June of 2014. We've got a rental car that, that month. There's phone evidence consistent with the defendant taking Sigredo Garcia to Comfort Rental on June 2nd 2014 at 8.53. She's there from about 8.53 to 8, uh, I don't know, 8.58, I think, maybe a little longer, where he rented a silver sedan. That was due back on June 5th, 2014 at 8.50 p.m. because it was rented at approximately 8.50 p.m. Could this be a coincidence? Could she have just been out near the airport visiting a friend while unbeknownst to her, Sigfredo Garcia was renting a car at Comfort Rental Car to take to Tallahassee to do a murder of her boyfriend's brother-in-law. Could be a coincidence. It's possible. But if so, she drove all the way out there only to hang out with Kenya for a few minutes, all the while talking to Charlie Adelson on the phone. In fact, she talks to Charlie Adelson for 25 minutes all the way home from the rental car place. Only an hour after renting the car, Sigfredo Garcia gets a ticket in the vehicle and ends up swapping it out for a different car the next day. Now, why would he swap it out if he got a ticket? After the first trip to Tallahassee, the rental car's last known location before its return was this defendant's home. So that rental car was at her, consistently being at her residence. And then at 4.30 p.m. the next day, she travels all the way back over to the airport, I guess, to see Kenya again for 20 more minutes, consistent with the rental car return. All right, so that, 
That's the June rental car. Let's talk about this first trip. Luis Rivera's phone shows the first trip to Tallahassee on June 4th, 2014. Now remember that the cell phone provider had no location information at all for Sigfredo Garcia for the early, for any early June events in 2014. So we can't put him anywhere. We can't say he was there, can't say he wasn't there. But we do know that he rented a car for the trip, received a citation while driving that first car like we just talked about, and that that rental car pinged in Tallahassee at Winthrop Park next to Dan Markell's house where Rivera says they waited while scoping out Dan Markell. When they returned to Miami, arriving in the early morning hours of June 6, 2014, um, the GPS data on the vehicle is consistent with traveling back to Miami along the same route as, and time as Rivera's phone. So we only have one GPS location on the way back, and it's consistent. And as I said before, upon returning to Miami, the rental car goes to the defendant's residence, and then the GPS ping puts the car at her home at 8.48 a.m. that next morning. During the first trip to Tallahassee, the defendant and Sigfredo Garcia have 16 total communications or attempted communications over the course of approximately 48 hours, which is how long approximately that first trip was. The defendant also calls Luis Rivera during that June trip, which is unusual. On June 5th, 2014, she dials Sigfredo Garcia at 10.57 and 10.58 p.m. When she can't reach him, she then dials this number ending in 6615, a number that she had saved in her phone as Tato, and that was at 10.59 p.m. It's unusual because this is the first time in the records that we have where this defendant is attempting to communicate with Rivera at all. It's important because it suggests that she knew Sigfredo and Luis Rivera were together. Sigfredo Garcia then returns her call at 11.01. At that time, the two men are in the rental car, headed back from Tallahassee, where they had been for the purpose of surveilling and possibly murdering Dan Markell, her boyfriend's problem relative. All right, let's talk about the July trip preparations. Charlie and the defendant have dinner together on July 14th. So remember, he's killed on the 18th. A couple days before, on July 14th, 2014, uh, Charlie Adelson and the defendant have dinner. We know from the cell records and iCloud me cloud messages that they made these plans to eat near the defendant's residence. And then there are multiple communications between the defendant and Garcia that night between midnight and 2 a.m. The next morning, July 15th, Sigfredo Garcia calls Comfort Rental Car, that's the same rental place from the first trip at 9.09 .09 a.m., and then calls the hybrid Save Gas rental car place at 4.30 p.m. Sigfredo Garcia and Luis Rivera then communicate several times, and then Luis Rivera and Sigfredo Garcia rent the Prius at 6.15 p.m. Then Sigfredo Garcia leaves Shrimp's house, that's Stephanie Carmona out near the beach, and moves toward defendant's house. So several communications over the course of that evening between 6.15 and 9.30 between Sigfredo Garcia and the defendant, but the communications between the two stop at 9.30 p.m. consistent with them being together. We don't usually text and call each other when we're in the same room. And their uh, phones are consistent with being at Catherine Magdano's that night. The Prius also pings at her residence at 10.25 p.m. on July 15th. All right, so let's go to our July trip. Sigredo Garcia and Luis Rivera traveled to Tallahassee on July 16th at around 2 p.m., getting in around 1 a.m. on July 17th, 2014. Rivera testified that Garcia was talking to and getting instructions from Catherine Magdana, Magdana quite a bit during this trip. She says things like, don't do anything stupid, make sure you do everything right. Although this trip was only about 36 hours from the time they left Miami to the time they returned to Miami, there were 22 phone events between Garcia and the defendant in that time frame. And on July 17th, the defendant also says, you have to get it done, tomorrow. You have to get it done because he's gonna be leaving town. 
as we know, Dan Markell was scheduled to fly to New York City on July 19th to visit his girlfriend. It's hard to imagine how Rivera could have been in possession of this piece of information if the info had not flowed as we see repeatedly in our communication records from Charlie to Katie to Garcia to Rivera. And Rivera says he posted a picture on Instagram and the defendant called and said, take it down, you idiots. You know, you, po you make a post on social media, they, there can be data associated with that that can tie you to where you are. And we don't want anybody to know you're in Tallahassee. Um, he obliged and removed the post, which is why we were not able to retrieve it from Instagram. But if you look at the slides for the July trip communication, there is a call from this defendant to Luis Rivera at 11.40 p.m. Again, this is unusual because this is only the second time of anywhere in the records where we see her attempting to call Luis Rivera, with the first time being the June trip. She doesn't get an answer, and she calls Garcia a few seconds later. When she can't get in touch with Garcia, she calls Rivera again at 11.41. Why was she calling Rivera and then calling Garcia when she couldn't get in touch with them? Because she knew they were together. And she was calling to say, take this stupid thing down. They were doing something stupid, just as she predicted. When she can't get one of them, she starts calling the other one. All right, so Friday, July 18th, 2014, this is the murder day. The Prius arrives at Premier at 9.16 a.m. The last phone communication, communications at all between either one of the men that came to do the killing was at 9.58 a.m. when their phones get turned off and remain off until after the murder. The Prius pulls out of the gym parking lot following Markell toward his residence at 10.38 a.m. The bus video shows the Prius turning on to Benton Road, really close to the Markell residence, at 10.44 a.m., whereby they pulled right up behind Markell in the driveway, executed him in cold blood, hopped back in the car, and they're off again. They're on the bus video, leaving town at 10.55. Um, the 911 call from Mr. Geiger comes in at 11 or 11.01. The first phone call either Sigfredo Garcia or Luis Rivera make after completing this murder or higher is Catherine McVanor. Sigfredo Garcia calls the defendant and says it's done. Defendant says, I know. We don't know how she knew. Maybe. They had their phones off, and then all of a sudden they called, and when she saw it ring, she knew, oh, it's got to be them telling me it's done. Maybe somebody gave her information before they called that it was done. We do not have that piece of information in the evidence. The defendant assures the killers that they will get their money. They are going to get their money the next day. When we look at the phone activity from all the parties from midnight before the murder through the first call after the murder. Um, and you can see the murder designated by a red line in this slide. We see a flurry of calls between our people of interest. And it's in that pattern, Donna to Charlie to Katie to Garcia and back the same way. Then we see the killers on an ATM camera in Pembroke Pines, Florida. The ATM photos show both Garcia and Rivera in the Prius taking some money out of the bank at 4, no, sorry, 6.46 p.m. The location after this ATM image is consistent with both men being at the Rivera residence at about 7 p.m. So where is Catherine Magbanwa once Garcia and Rivera arrived back in Miami after the murder? Friday evening, she's speaking to Charlie Adelson. She's speaking to Sigfredo Garcia. She's also speaking to Yendra. After 8.46 p.m., she leaves her home and travels towards Rivera's residence, getting there at about 9.46 p.m. And on the way there, she drops her kids off at Yendra Mascara's residence. This was unusual. She didn't usually leave her kids anywhere or anywhere overnight. And it was documented the date of this particular event on Ms. Mascara's social media. Remember, she had to go refresh her memory as to when it, that photo was taken of the kids at her house and came back to tell you that the night that those kids stayed at her house was July 18, 2014. 
the night after Dan Markell was killed, the night she needed to go to Charlie's to get the money to pay them the next morning. There's a text earlier in the day where she's making plans to stay at Charlie's house that night. She turns her phone off on the way and it stays off for almost 11 hours. 11 hours of time when her kids are in the care of Yendra. While she's with Charlie, this is about 14 hours later after the shooting and this is about the time that Dan Markell is pronounced deceased at the hospital here in Tallahassee succumbing to the terrible injuries that he sustained when he was shot. When the defendant's phone pops back up after spending the night at Charlie's, the night of the murder, it's Saturday morning and she's headed back south from Charlie's house toward the money drop location. All right, so let's talk about this. July 19th, the money drop. We've got a 45 minute call flurry that's observed. And again, it's that same sort of pattern of communication that we're seeing over and over again. The defendant's phone is powered on and she starts calling Garcia at 9.44 a.m. She calls him five times and texts him as she's driving south from Charlie's home. When she can't reach Garcia, she calls a number that she had programmed into her phone as Jessica Flocka. That was at 9.47 a.m. Then that number, that Jessica Flocka um, number, starts trying to reach Rivera as well. And simultaneously, Rivera starts trying to reach Garcia, and the defendant continues to try to reach, the gar try to reach out to Garcia as well. Remember, he's out at Shrimp's house. Then Rivera calls the defendant. So that's the call where everyone's like, oh, shit. He, he called her, she didn't call him. But a lot of things happened before he called her. So he did talk to her, that seems to be undisputed. And defendant now has a working number for Rivera because she's actually talked to him on this new phone, this phone number that he had that he brought to Tallahassee. Um, she then calls him back twice after their last call and he, his phone, remember, goes out to Shrimps and then comes back where they're all consistent with being at Rivera and Jessica's residence, and that's when the money drop occurs. Phones put them all there for the money drop. Um, that wasn't in any police report. That's something we got from Luis Rivera and were able to verify with evidence. We learned about the money drop from Rivera and then called Jessica and said, hey, did this happen? And she said, oh yeah, that did happen. Sergeant Corbett testified about Luis Rivera's locations the morning of the money drop when the call flurry began. So Rivera's phone starts out, and there seems to be some dispute about this. It's consistent with his residence or the barbershop, which are close together, <coughs> when this call flurry begins. Then it travels out to Shrimp's house, where Garcia was, and then they all converge back together at Rivera's place at 10.34 a.m. Okay, so the defendant does not have any activity on her phone during this money drop time, 10.31 to 11.23 a.m. that morning, consistent with her going inside Rivera's for a few minutes, seeing the baby, the package getting delivered, and then going on their way. 11.23 is her next communication, and by then she's just south of Rivera's, consistent with heading to Yendra Mascaro's residence, and we know why she's there, she's got to pick up her kids where she um, had dropped them off the night before. And when she picks the kids up, what does she say to Yendra? Charlie Adelson's brother-in-law was in a car accident. All right, so let's talk about the financial evidence. Catherine Magbanawa began getting checks from the Adelson Institute two months after Markell's murder. Is it reasonable that Charlie Adelson would put her on the payroll two months after this murder if they were in a status where they had broken up and he was ghosting her if she had nothing to do with the killing? She received over $17,000 from the Adelson Institute over the course of a year and a half for doing something that is yet to be determined. Despite my co-counsel's best efforts, she didn't work in the office. She wasn't she doesn't seem to be have been making phone calls on the Adelson Institute's behalf or Charlie Adelson's behalf. Um, never went to the office on weekends. Didn't clean up. We established that the cleaner uppers was a husband and wife team. 
As far as we can tell, she made an appointment to get a website a month <laughs> before her first paycheck was received. Many of her checks that she received from the Adelson Institute were sequential, meaning written in numerical order, so a bunch of checks at once. She got six sequential checks two times in just a few months. Other Adelson em uh, employees said that they had gotten a, a couple, I think they said either two or three sequential checks before, but never six. Uh, and that was only if the Adelsons were going to be going on vacation and miss the pay period. It should be noted that Adelson Institute is, you know, they stopped issuing her checks after Garcia was arrested. You heard about the breast augmentation. So a month after the defendant was added to the Adelson Institute payroll for the supposed purpose of getting Medicaid insurance for her kids, she paid $4,400 in cash for a breast augmentation surgery. And this expenditure was um, just three months after the murder. There is no corresponding cash withdrawal from her account for the purchase. And note that June said Charlie was, had admitted to paying for one of them. Yinder told, said, I guess she said that the defendant told her that Garcia had paid for them. And the defendant told you on the stand that, that she paid for them and had saved up for them. Defendant's highest source of income in 2014 and 2015 is cash. Cash was only 23% of her total income in 2013, but jumped up to 64% of her total income as shown here in 2014. In 2015, cash checks from the Adelson Institute made up 71% of her total income that year. In 2014, she deposits $46,000, three times as much money as the year before the murder and twice as much as the year after the murder. She deposits $13,200 in cash in the month following the murder. That's her big spike. And that's more than she deposited in the entire previous year. Whatever she was doing or not doing at the clubs, she is very unlucky if she's not guilty because she happened to have the most incredible month of her life financially immediately following the murder of Dan Markell. All right, I want to talk about the wiretap. When the undercover hands Donna Adelson an article about her murdered son-in-law and insinuates that she was involved and then tries to extort $5,000 out of her, does she go straight to the police? Does she give law enforcement this valuable information that could be used to solve the murder, the murder of her son, uh, former son-in-law? I mean, this guy that approached her supposedly was involved in the murder. So first of all, he's a gangster, he's dangerous. He's murdered one of her family members or knows someone who has or has information about this murder that's unsolved in her family. And she does not call the police. She calls Charlie Adelson. She puts that paper without even looking at, looking at it into her purse, goes, gets the kids, goes back into the icon, calls Charlie Adelson and says, this TV's got to be about five. It has to do with the two of us. They mentioned an ex-girlfriend. Does Charlie Adelson say, an ex-girlfriend? Whose ex-girlfriend? My ex-girlfriend? Which ex-girlfriend? Mm-mm. He doesn't have to ask that. The like, undercover does put Katie's name in this. He does say Katie. But Donna doesn't say Katie. And he doesn't have to ask which ex-girlfriend. They don't even say your son. They just, they mention an ex-girlfriend. And he goes straight to her. Once he, Charlie Adelson, meets with his mother and gets the details and the paper with the undercover's phone number, he goes straight to Catherine McBanawa. They do this meeting at Dolce Vita. And the defendant in Dolce, she, she took the stand and she claims she does not know there was a murder. She never even knew there was a murder in this case. Not just she didn't have anything to do with it. 
So y'all have to like listen to those wiretaps and consider that as her defense. She's supposedly doing and saying all these things with no information whatsoever, that there was even a murder. And this is a college educated woman. Charlie Adelson says, this is either someone trying to blackmail his family or it's the cops working undercover. I mean, that's that much you can definitely, I can hear it, I hope y'all can hear it. I don't know why she can't hear it. Why doesn't she say, why are the cops approaching <coughs> your mother? Is there a reason? I mean, what's this about? Did your mother do something that the police would be investigating? Does he even have to explain to her? Like, my brother-in-law was killed in Tallahassee. There's suspicion on us, and I suspect this could be law enforcement, undercover operation trying to investigate the murder. It could be somebody that has information about the murder that's affiliated with these killers. He doesn't have to explain any of that to her. And they say, oh, well, maybe he did it in the car before they went in there, but she says she never knew about a murder at all until Garcia's arrest in May. Charlie Adelson says, if they had any evidence, we'd already be at the airport by now. Even if they bug your phone, you're still not talking about any of this. What else would she have not been talking about other than the murder of Dan Markell? And how could she be talking about it or not talking about it if she didn't know a darn thing about it? Charlie begins explaining how you have to be able to put the person at the scene at the time in order to be able to prove the crime. You can't just say my brother shot JFK. You have to have evidence. So he's reassuring her, we're good. We're not in this. Um, even if you sat in the Prius, it doesn't matter. You know, a car just because a car went to do a crime and you sat in it previously is not going to make a difference. They're not going to be able to prove you did the crime. You're not going to be able to prove you robbed the Burger King. Charlie says it's one of two scenarios. So number one being the cops, number two being a legitimate blackmail effort. And at some point, a third possibility is discussed, which is maybe this is just somebody who read something in the papers and saw an opportunity to try to go, you know, up to my mother and see if they could make some money. And that is why it was important to give details and information in the bump, because otherwise they would have discounted it as not being legitimate. So what really does worry them and think that this might be coming from the inside is the fact that this person has information. And they talk about that. Charlie says, whoever it is knows information. This person knows information, so Katie, they'll be back. And she says, there's not a lot of people that know much about, can't hear what she says. What is she, what could she be referring to? Not a lot of people that know much about what? And we asked her on cross. What, what, what were we saying there? Not a lot of people that know much about what? She doesn't know. She can't tell you. No memory of it. No information about what happened in that restaurant. No memory of a man coming to you and trying to get you to have contact with some thugs that approached his mother to blackmail her about a murder. Charlie says, if they're a bad guy, there's two ways of dealing with it. Go ahead and contact the police. They'll contact him and arrange a, a setup, take him down, and he'll proffer 10 years and tell everything. Tell us everything you know, or else you're going to serve 10 years in prison. The next thing you know, this person is singing. He starts calling your name out. And my parents are going to have to say, going to have to tell tell the story of what happened. Why would a bad guy be calling her name out if she knows nothing? Why are the cops knocking at her door an issue of concern for her if she knows nothing? They talk about going to the cops, going to the FBI, but nobody ever does that, that obvious thing, including this defendant. 
if you're innocent and a bad guy is out there trying to put your name in something, you go straight to the cops. All right, so Charlie says, this is my idea. I give you the money. You talk to him on the phone. And he gives very precise instructions. Say, my friends have no idea what you're talking about. And frankly, I don't know what you're talking about. But the name sounds familiar of who's incarcerated. So I'm going to give you something as charity to help the less fortunate. But do not contact these people again, or they're going to the police. He's instructing her to call this thug and say something particular, OK? And the whole time, just say, I don't know what's going on, and only use the words help and charity. <clears throat> then he talks or mentions who we think and are arguing is Segredo Garcia. He says, now he's fucking with his wife, and he's fucking with him, and you fuck with the king himself, you'd better kill him because he's going to be a big problem. Catherine Magbanoa, seated at this table in Dolce Vita, having no information whatsoever about this case, no knowledge whatsoever about a murder, has now been, it's been suggested to her that she might need to kill or arrange to kill or have Sigfredo Garcia kill this undercover operative who they think is a thug. And what is her reaction to that? My God, she continues to engage in the conversation. She gets up and goes to the bathroom and comes back and then goes out to the car and goes about her business. And then she engages in following up on the instructions he gave her. And she doesn't call the number. She tries to get Garcia to call it. She doesn't say kill. I'm not killing anybody. What are you talking about? Kill. Kill might be a word you might remember. OK, Catherine McVanoa. What did you think when he said you might have to kill the guy? I don't know. I have no recollection of that, no knowledge of that, no information whatsoever to give you. All right, well, after you said he was going to kill the guy, why would you go out and do what he asked you to do? Why didn't you just say, oh, okay, I'll take care of that? Police. Because she's involved. I mean, there is no other explanation. I'm not taking it out of context. There is only one context. The alternate context is, I don't know anything. Can't offer any context. Can't tell you what I was thinking. Can't tell you why I did what I did. Because I have no memory of doing it, no memory of saying it, no memory of being there. can offer you nothing. <laughs> then Charlie says, and so help me God, and please, I know I'm dropping all these F-bombs on you, but it's not my words. And so help me God, if they fuck with my family, it's going to be fucking Nazi shit. Because this will be done. I mean, Katie, I don't care what I spend, okay? He doesn't care what it costs him. She needs to take care of this problem. Then they talk about Garcia. He doesn't have any bad feelings toward me, does he? Our paths never crossed. He's making sure everything is kosher with Garcia to get this thing resolved. There's more evidence here that Charlie doesn't have an independent relationship with Garcia because he's going through her. Is he going to in If someone's on to him and it's somebody that this information has leaked to or it's worse, law enforcement, he is not going to invite someone new into his conspiracy. He's checking with her to see if Garcia has any bad feelings toward him. After he talks about having someone killed and not caring what he has to spend, he checks in on Garcia and then assures her that she will be taken care of. Quote, I don't have to sit here and tell you what I would do. I show you what I could do. You know what I'm saying? You know how I am. I look for things to do. You don't ask me for shit. I'm the one that's like, Hey, someone's birthday is coming up. I got you. I'm the one who's like, I'll sell you the Lexus for a very good price. I know you're having car problems. And then he says, listen, you giving somebody money is not an admission of any kind of guilt. Guilt of what, folks? What would she be guilty of? She doesn't even know there's a murder.
Charlie, let me ask you a question. When everybody was there the next day, and there's something about money, and then he says this, it's not like you're driving around in a Bentley, cruising around in a mega yacht. At the end of the conversation, he says, you know who this is coming from, the inside. Catherine McBean, well, what did you understand that to mean? It's coming from the inside. She doesn't know. I don't know. And wasn't curious to find out. And wasn't curious to call the cops to end it, to get herself out of it. In these initial recordings that we've got, the Dolce and the first few calls, it's like they're dancing around each other, you know, the code and the... I don't know, it's like neither one is sure if the other is working with law enforcement. Neither one is sure if the other is affiliated with the blackmail attempt. I mean, she's sure he's not. He's not sure she's not affiliated with the guy that approached his mother. He's not sure she's not wearing a wire. And she can't be sure that this guy that approached Donna Adelson isn't, in fact, one of Rivera's brothers. And you'll hear her on the wire clarifying that a couple times. Did he say brother or did he say family member? Because brother potentially could mean gang member, right? And she isn't honest with Charlie about those concerns because she's walled him off from Tuto and Tato. And neither defendant nor Charlie can be sure you know what this thing really is, what the risks are here. So they're both just sort of feeling each other out. After the meeting with Donna that we saw, Charlie and Donna there at the marina, um, there's several calls where he's assuring her, like, this is being handled, don't worry about it, you know, mom, you're freaking out, it's nothing, I got this, it's all handled. We hear call H, H is the first call where we hear Garcia, and he is not happy. He doesn't sound like a guy who's done something stupid and gotten her involved in a murder that he's to blame for. It sounds more like he's someone who she's gotten involved in something and now he's going to have to clean up the mess. Maybe because, you know, she came clean about, I don't know, he's angry. He's angry. Ultimately, Garcia says he will take care of the problem. The less she knows, the better. Stop talking about it on the phone, and he hangs up. All right, so then the defendant calls Garcia with a number. She repeatedly is talking in code about a phone number. Why on earth would she be talking in code about a phone number? Just say 6570. The number is 6570. But she, instead, she says the kid's clothes cost $65.70. He doesn't get it. It goes back and forth several times. And finally, he does get what she's saying. The defendant's asked about talking in code and why it would be necessary if she had nothing to conceal. And she says a couple things. One, she says she had to disguise the phone number while speaking on the phone because her coworkers were around, which makes no sense. Two, she says, oh, I just started talking in code because I picked it up from Charlie. Doesn't make sense that she would then carry it over to her conversations with other people, including Sigfredo Garcia. The only reason to talk in code is for fear that the call might be being recorded. This is the time frame. Um, you hear that bad argument between the defendant and Sigfredo Garcia. They split at some point in call M um, he, she's wanting to talk to him and he's not interested. She sends a text saying she needs to talk to him about something that's text N. And also in text O, um, he replies and says, whatever is going on with you and your homie is your business. You guys work that shit out. Don't text me. Call P, where the code really good client is born. Defendant says she has forgotten the number for that client. And Charlie says he'll get it to her. Then he calls his mom and says, hey, what's the number on the paper? She says, I don't know. I gave it to you. So then he's got to go home and get it. There's a volley of calls, a lot of number confusion where everybody's talking about the number. But when I say everybody, what I mean is Donna to Charlie to Katie to Garcia and back that same way. Never 
jumping over one car. So if you think about them like car, train cars on a track, got to go through one to get to the other. In call R, Charlie tells the defendant that it's going to be a while before he can get the number. Again, she initiates code saying, it's always so hard to get that particular agent. Then we get call S, where McBannell is giving Garcia the undercover's number again, and she does it in code. Remember one of the listings I had to tell you, one of the properties. I believe it's 305 712 6570. Then call you is from Donna to Charlie about the undercover calling the office. So that's the tickling the wire. And we went through that during the testimony. <clears throat> and that's when we get to call W. And this is the call W where I say we've got an illustration of the fact that there's two Katie's in this case. We've got Katie that was on the stand and we've got the Katie that was in call W. When Charlie calls and informs her, about the call to the office. He's getting a little fussy with her, pressuring her, find out who this is. And she pushes back. It's really important because when she pushes back, she kind of drops the code and comes really close to revealing the truth more so than any other statement she's made. Mm -hmm. Charlie's trying to get defendant to call the number. The defendant's trying to get Garcia to call the number. Garcia is lying to the defendant, saying he called the number when he didn't. She's lying to Charlie, saying she called the number when she didn't. And Charlie's lying to his mother, telling her everything's fine, handled. Eventually, Charlie ends up calling the undercover, and y'all heard that call. So what does he say when the undercover says, you know, your family's problem up north has been taken care of, um, You've been taking care of Katie and Tuto, but haven't done anything for Tato. What does he say about this family problem up north? Does he say, I have no idea what you're talking about. Why did you give my mom a picture of my murdered brother-in-law? What do you know about that? What information do you have? Who are you, you know? He just says, all right, let me look into things. Then in call Y, Charlie Adelson is reporting back to Catherine McBanoa what the undercover told him in that call. And Charlie says, the undercover says Tuto and Tato, although he struggles with those names because he doesn't seem to know them. Magdanawa doesn't enlighten him as to who those people are. I mean, she knows who Tuto and Tato are. She's supposedly trying to help him. She doesn't know anything about this murder. She's only trying to help him because his family's being harassed. Yet, in her help, she doesn't suggest, well, Tuto and Tato are these two guys. That's because she's insulating Garcia and Charlie from each other. She's walling them off. She was the glue in this conspiracy. It does not work without her. Call Z, Catherine McBanawa reporting the latest um, bump to Garcia. And she says, quote, this is call Z, it's getting too detailed. It's somebody that knows for sure. This call ends with more discussion about what the number is. Garcia wants her to text it to him, and she says, no, I don't want to. Why? Why don't you want to text it? Why are we talking in code? You're just trying to help out a friend. Figure this thing out. You have nothing to do with it. Call DD. Charlie is further relating his discussion with the undercover. He said he was brothers with someone in Broward. And she clarifies again, and that's the call where she's saying brother or family member a couple times. Um, and that's the call where she says, they really mess with the wrong person. I fuck bitches up for no reason. You know, she's talking really tough. Um, call FF. Katie is bragging about the really nasty voicemail that she left on the undercover's voicemail when the truth is nobody had called um, and left any such voicemail on the undercover's recorder. Um, so she's playing both of these guys. She's lying. She's manipulating both of both sides of this conspiracy. And then we've got call GG, which you got a couple more calls after this on the exhibit, but this was the last one that I played because I felt like you guys were starting to yawn. Um, but, understandably. Um, but sh she says in that call, it can only be one of two, apparently. And they're talking about different scenarios. If somebody, it's somebody's that desperate, 
not from the inside, I mean, I'm not saying this makes sense, but not from the inside because there's too much from the inside that the other person knows from the outside, so they won't risk it. That's why I know for a fact it's not from the inside. It's somebody trying to be greedy. Probably, you know, hey, everybody knew, everybody knew who, who I've dated in the past and stuff. I've had a couple boyfriends, you know. So she's saying, like, I, I have investigated the matter, and I do not think this is a legitimate threat from the inside of our conspiracy to murder Dan Markell. Charlie replies, it's somebody not from the first layer, but probably the second layer. Yeah, and they just made a big mistake. So that's sort of the finale of the evidence in the case, is her saying, she's resolved it. So it's not somebody from the inside. I want to turn my attention a little bit to the jury instructions. The defendant in this case is charged with conspiracy to commit murder, solicitation to commit murder, and first degree murder as a principle. Why all three charges? The defendant didn't just ask Sigfredo Garcia to do this and pay for it. That would be solicitation. She didn't just take Charlie Adelson's family problem and turn it into action. That would be conspiracy. <coughs> she got the thing done. Dan Markell is dead. This is the work of this conspiracy, and this is why there is a murder charge, not just conspiracy and solicitation. To prove the crime of first degree murder, I must prove to you that this was premeditated. I don't even want to talk to you about the lesser included offenses because there is so much evidence of premeditation. Like, whoever did it was definitely premeditated, right? Premeditation is defined as killing after consciously deciding to do so. So I think that's abundantly clear. This murder was in the works for over a year. It began with the failed relocation efforts when Charlie first looked into hiring a hitman, and it took root when Catherine Magbanoa enlisted Garcia, who then enlisted Rivera, to do this killing. The planning that went into the killing was extensive, spanning a six-week period, including 2,000-mile trips to Tallahassee, made in rented vehicles, scouting and stalking Professor Markell. All the planning, all the meetings, and all the calls came to fruition when Sigfredo Garcia fired those two shots into Mr. Markell's vehicle, which devastated so many lives. When you think about how this case was proven, we started at a single point, the crime scene. And we went in two totally different directions. We chased a Prius, and we chased the bad blood with the in-laws. All these little breadcrumbs led to the same place. The Prius led to Garcia and Rivera. The bad blood led to the Adelsons, and both trails lead to this defendant. I want to spend a little time talking about the principal instruction, and we talked about this in jury selection. Catherine Magbanoa didn't pull the trigger that day. She didn't come to Tallahassee, but that doesn't mean that she isn't just as responsible as the folks that did. And the people that hired her to do it. Think of it like this. If you have a gun, each player can be a part in how the shot is fired. Garcia was the bullet. Charlie Adelson was the finger wrapped around the trigger. The defendant was the gun. Without every piece, without every function, without every part of it, you don't have the end result. And Dan Markell would still be alive, he may still be alive. So in your jury instructions, it says there's two ways to prove Catherine Magdano's guilt under the law of principles. One, if she intended that the murder be done, and she did some act or said some word that caused or helped another to commit the crime, then she's guilty of first degree murder. Or two, if she intended the murder be done and she promised payment in exchange for the murder and the crime was committed by another person, then she's guilty of first degree murder. So there's two ways it can be either or both. In this case, I would suggest it's both, but if y'all are unanimous on either, then your verdict should be guilty. Luis Rivera called the defendant the mastermind. He said she hired Sigfredo Garcia to do this murder. She told him when the murder needed to happen because Markel was leaving town the next day. 
She gave Garcia spending money for the both trips to Tallahassee. She drove Garcia to get a rental car. She got angry with Rivera when he posted something on social media from Tallahassee. She got the money from Charlie. She delivered the stapled money to the killers. And finally, she got paid too. The burden today on the state is to prove to you this case beyond a reasonable doubt. The jury instructions tell you that a reasonable doubt is not a mere possible, speculative, or imaginary doubt. It's not forced. So when you're back there delivering, deliberating, ask yourself, I mean, you have to assess these things. Is this a reasonable doubt? Is this a reasonable doubt? What is reasonable? If you find yourself speculating, then it's not a reasonable doubt. Well, what if? It's possible that. If you don't have evidence to support it, actual evidence, not what the lawyers say, evidence, testimony or items introduced, then that's speculation. I want to touch on the defendant's statements just a little bit more. She took the stand, and there's some things that we heard from her. She was confronted with the fact that Charlie did a, a lot of favors for her right after the murder. Even though they weren't together, he paid for a trip to the Dominican Republic, offered to pay for a cruise, paid for car repairs, gave her money and loans when she asked for it. You saw a text where she was asking for money, and then the next day, uh, deposits $1,400 worth of cash into her account, and he put her on the payroll. The defendant told us when her, when her attorney was asking her questions that the defendant had ghosted her, ghosted her prior to putting her on the payroll. If he ghosted her after the murder in August of 2014, why would he want her to become his personal assistant? She could not answer that question. When asked, what what, is, what do you do as his personal assistant? She could not answer that question. She, these are easy questions, folks. What was your job? She couldn't answer them. She said she didn't schedule patients. She said she set up an appointment. You know, you heard about the one appointment. She said she collected rent but couldn't tell you when or from whom. She was paid over $17,000 over the course of a year and a half to help Charlie set up an appointment to go get a website, and that was done two months before she started collecting the money. Why would Donna Adelson agree to write all these checks to her son's ex-girlfriend who wasn't doing anything for the money? What about that text about what she had done for the family what about her? It's so special. I mean, he's got a million ex-girlfriends. He's not paying for all the stuff for them. She couldn't answer that question. You heard she was previously questioned in 2019. You heard about this jail interview where the defense invited my team to come ask her anything we wanted. And you saw Ms. Dugan do her damnedest to ask questions. And it's like trying to nail jello to a wall. You're not going to get answers. Where were you working in the summer of 2014? Janelle. You heard from Yindra about the work. You heard from the club owners that she wasn't making the kind of money that she says she was making there. She said she was making $1,500 a night, but the evidence is to the contrary. And if she was doing it, she only did it the month after the murder. The wiretap calls. Defendant says Charlie called her because she was his last ex-girlfriend, but we know that's not true. When Charlie was acting like he didn't know who Tuto was on the wiretap, she doesn't enlighten him. He doesn't know who Tato is. She doesn't enlighten him. The only reason they're <coughs> walling each other off, the only reason they're speaking in code is because they are guilty, because they are concerned law enforcement is listening. She testified that she knows nothing about this crime at all, even after the bump and all of her involvement in these wire calls and calling the number, not calling the number, getting someone else to call the number. She says she did not even know there was a murder. In opening statement, the defense told us that they would offer definitive proof 
Can we have the next slide, please? That there was a link between Garcia and Catherine Magbanawa that did not involve this defendant. And now you have seen all of the evidence in this case and heard the testimony of the witnesses, including this defendant. And we are no closer to proving the defense's theory than we were in opening statement. What is the smoking gun? The fact that they both had the same auto mechanic? That would be speculation. A reasonable doubt is not a speculative doubt. Has the evidence shown communication through the auto mechanic? No. To the contrary, the evidence has repeatedly shown communication through this defendant, communication around all the critical times in this case, communication that was overheard or relayed to, overheard by or relayed to Luis Rivera, communication related to the murder even on the wiretaps. You get to hear them talking about issues related to this case and you get to see how the communication does in fact flow through here. You don't have to guess. You don't have to just look at the communication pattern and listen to the testimony of Luis Rivera. You can hear it for yourself. <coughs> what happens when we plant information in the hands of Donna Adelson? It goes boom, boom, boom. Right down the line. She is right in the middle of it as she acknowledged. I know how it looks. I know I'm right in the middle of it. But she's not there because she was manipulated by others. She's there because of the choices that she made. I've been straining my pea brain trying to figure out why the defense, who agrees wholeheartedly that Sigfredo Garcia did this murder, has worked so hard to suggest that he wasn't on that June trip with Luis Rivera. And you remember the traffic ticket where there's that little box that you check for if, there's, if it's a 16 passenger vehicle or not, and it wasn't checked, and they're interpreting that to mean Rivera was the only one in the car. It finally came to me this morning that it's because their confrontation at dinner theory, so there's no evidence of a confrontation at all, but there was a dinner that occurred in March of 2014. Lacoste was there, Wendy was there, um, Charlie was there, and this defendant were there. Um, Luis Rivera told you that Garcia was furious. He couldn't stand Charlie's guts. And he and Rivera were both in the car watching her eating with the dentist. And Garcia wanted to you know, run through the patio and kill everybody on the patio. And Rivera told him, talked him down, and they decided not to do that and went on their way. There was no confrontation. Lacoste hung out with Charlie later in the hot tub that night, and there was no mention of it. The defendant even told you herself that there was no confrontation other than the jet ski incident that occurred on July 1st. So I thought, well, July 1st, that's when Sigfredo Garcia tries to confront the defendant and Charlie Adelson as they're backing out to go jet skiing. And he's making a scene in the street, and Charlie Adelson refuses to engage and edges around him, and they are able to drive away. That is the same day, July 1st, 14, 2014, is when Garcia attempts to call <coughs> Charlie Adelson and gets Harvey Adelson and leaves that voicemail. So that's when the confrontation occurs, although they don't really get face to face because Charlie's in a car the whole time. The problem for the defense is if Garcia and Charlie struck up this deal that they told you about an opening statement whereby Charlie, you know, it goes from I'm going to fight you because you're sleeping with my wife to I'll do a murder for you for $100,000 if you'll leave my wife alone. If that happens on or about March 11th at the dinner meeting, then it doesn't make sense that he would make this deal with Charlie go to Tallahassee in June to stalk and or kill, and then July 1st not know how to get in touch with Charlie Adelson. So that's the problem, like, doesn't make sense. He's looking for Charlie Adelson, he doesn't know how to get in touch with him. If he had this confrontation that resulted in a pact to do a murder in March, then he would already have Charlie Adelson's information, be able to call Charlie Adelson and confront him after the jet ski incident, wouldn't need to accidentally leave a voice message for Harvey. 
So that theory is completely speculative. It does not fit with the evidence in this case. All the evidence is consistent with Garcia traveling to Tallahassee. Remember, he's the one that rented the car. That car pinged in Tallahassee. And I would even take this analysis a step further and suggest that the fact that Garcia is trying to confront Charlie on July 1st, which is after that June trip, is evidence that he is walled off from Charlie in reference to this conspiracy. I don't think he's going to be trying to fight the guy that he's in the process of trying to do a murder for. A guy that's about to pay him $100,000 or his portion of $100,000 to do a murder two weeks later. This theory is further evidenced by what he told Rivera. He told Rivera they were coming to Tallahassee to do a murder so that the lady, Wendy, could get her kids back. Does that say 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I believe he did think he was doing this murder for a lady in Tallahassee, not Charlie Adelson, and possibly not even with the knowledge that the lady in Tallahassee was related to Charlie Adelson, the dentist. Regardless of how completely clueless she acted on the stand yesterday, the evidence shows that this defendant was not the pawn in someone else's scheme. She was not the pawn of two master manipulators. She herself was the stage manager in this thing. She was directing these guys. The defendant is guilty of everything she's charged with. You have all been so very patient throughout this entire process. And when you get back there to the deliberation room, I encourage you to bring your common sense with you. And you're going to need it to cull through all this stuff. Um, the defense may ask you to speculate about things that are not in evidence. Don't do that. Remember that what the lawyers say, including me, is not evidence. Remember that you alone must decide what the evidence is, what, what evidence to accept, and how reliable the evidence is. They may tell you that just because all the evidence fits, it's not what it appears to be, it's really the opposite of what it appears, or that the state is blindly or willfully misleading you in some way, please remember that your feelings about the lawyers should not influence your verdict at all. You should use your common sense in deciding based on the evidence and the law that the judge gives you. You decide what to accept and what to disregard. We are all trusting you to render a wise and legal verdict in this case. And I trust that that verdict will be guilty as charged. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Kaplan. Okay. We're going to take our uh, morning break now. Uh, you can leave your instructions right on your chair along with everything else. And please remember, no discussing the case at this point. And we'll take a 15-minute break. We'll start back at 11 with the defense closing argument. Okay? All right, jury's out of the courtroom. The door is closed, and uh, we'll be in recess until 11 o'clock. We'll start promptly at that time, okay? All right, thank you.
just know that it takes a minute for things to pop in. About the I'm blank right now. Yeah. All right, anything from council before we bring the jury in? Okay, nothing from the state. Let's bring the jury in, please. Okay, please be seated. Thank you. Okay, please be seated. We're ready to continue now uh, to the, to the uh, defense closing argument, and Ms. Kowas, you may proceed. Members of the jury, good morning. good morning. Now, before I get started with my closing argument, I wanted, on behalf of myself, my co-counsel, the court, everyone in this courtroom, and especially my client, Catherine McBamwell, to say thank you. If it were not for jurors just like you, the justice system would come to a grinding halt. Each of you dedicated the time out of your own lives to sit here and to listen to the evidence in this case. And I can guarantee you that there is not one person in this room who is more grateful than Catherine McBamwell. This is not an easy case. You have been here each and every day for two weeks, always here on time, very, very long days, tons of witnesses and evidence, and each of you came in every day and sat down and pay attention and listened. At the beginning of this case, I told you that there would be only one question that you would have to answer at the close of all the evidence. Did the state prove to you beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt that Catherine McBanwell knew about and helped commit the murder of Dan Markell. I also made it very clear at the beginning of this case that the only evidence that the state would present to you that Catherine McBanwell was allegedly part of this are the words of the convicted murderer and gang member, Louis Rivero. And I was right. So let's start at the beginning, because you have to start at the beginning to understand what happened here and how an innocent woman ended up having to fight for her life for something that she did not do. This, members of the jury, is an anatomy of a wrongful prosecution. Now, do not get me wrong. The investigation that was initially done by the Tallahassee Police Department led them directly to Sigfredo Garcia, and Luis Rivero. They also already had their main suspects, the Adelson family, more specifically, Donna and Charlie. But how were they going to connect these two groups of people who seemed to have nothing connecting them? And the easiest answer that they could find and that they went with was Catherine McManon. Now, we went over in jury selection, and we talked about this at great length, how important it is for the police and the prosecution to be objective when they are investigating any case. The police and the prosecutors, they are the ones that hold this awesome power to take away the liberty and freedom of the citizens of this state. And with that great power comes great responsibility the responsibility to make sure that they remain objective and investigate everything. Because it is more important, one of their jobs is to protect Ms. McBanwell, to ensure 
that innocent people are not convicted for crimes that they did not commit. And they failed Catherine at every single stage of this proceeding. Now, the state wants you to believe that there was no direct link between Sigfredo Garcia and the Adelsons. They say that they have no evidence of this. But as you saw here in this courtroom, throughout the course of this trial, that is completely false. It was the call from Sigfredo Garcia directly to the Adelson family that cracked the case open for them. Literally, the reason they were able to find Garcia is because of the call he made to the Adelsons. They may get up here and try to diminish its importance because it goes directly against their theory. Oh, it's just one call. It's a call. It's there. That's the link. Once they had Garcia and Rivero, and then saw that Catherine had a relationship with Charlie Adelson, they started to build their case around their theory that this must have gone through her. Now, let's be real about what the state is trying to sell you guys. This is where I need you to just apply your common sense. They actually want you to believe that Charles Adelson, a brilliant master manipulator, that's how their witnesses described him, decided to ask the girl he was dating for a few months if she could get someone, her ex-boyfriend, to kill a man she never met. That is their theory. Do you really think that Charles Adelson then decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to use my phone to communicate about this murder. That way no one will ever find out. Members of the jury, it's not the 1990s when cell phones just came out and everybody didn't know what their capabilities of recording your phone calls and your records. It's all there. You remember what Ryan Fitzpatrick told you. He's brilliant. He would never use his phone, as would anybody else with any common sense, to orchestrate a murder. This is someone who Charlie knew for years. This is the one witness that could come in here besides Wendy Adelson, because you can just discredit every single thing that came out of Wendy Adelson's mouth. But Ryan Fitzpatrick came here and told you who the real Charles Adelson is. A manipulator, brilliant, someone that can see something and just work on it quickly. The state keeps harping on these flurry of communications between the parties, even though each one of their witnesses got up there on that witness stand and told you there is nothing unusual about a woman having communications with the guy she was dating, and then also talking to the father of her children. Every single one of their witnesses said that, including Agent Sanford, who you could tell for yourself was just not open to anything other than his theory of the case. Let's talk about the call detail records. Sergeant Corbett. I know everybody remembers Sergeant Corbett. You have to love Sergeant Corbett, because he is the epitome of an unbiased witness. His job is to interpret records, and even he told you, even though it's not good for their theory, he cannot tell you. He even told you that the communications that they presented to you, they're not complete. We don't have everything. We can only go off of what is in the call detail records, right? What makes it even worse, they then present these summaries to you only from the call detail records. And what do they do? They literally get up here and ask you after they've taken out every other phone number that is on the call detail records and just left the numbers of the people who they think are involved to rely on that and that that is somehow complete reliable evidence that this is a flurry of communication of people that are committing a murder. Why is it that the state, who has the job of proving the case beyond all reasonable doubt, the job to show you all of the evidence, is taking out all, of the, call, all the other calls from the records and only creating charts that have the names of the people that they believed were involved. That would make anybody look guilty. There are these numbers on Catherine's phone records when they present it to you. You notice when they start putting up, oh look, these are the calls from the June 2nd date. There are all these numbers there that are unaccounted for. They are the Tallahassee Police Department and the FBI. They told you that all they have to do is send a subpoena. And poof, they get the information. They didn't do that. They have Catherine's contact list because they have her phone. But the only names that they take out of her contact list 
Louis, Zigfredo, and Jessica, the people that help their case. What is her mother's phone number? What's her brother's phone number? What are her best friend's phone numbers? They didn't even look or try to figure out who are the other people that she was communicating with. Why are they leaving all of those numbers out, members of the jury? We know they can do it. They did it for Wendy's call detail records. Look at the day of the murder. Her list comes up and every single number has a name associated. So you know they can do it. We specifically talked in jury selection about how important it is to investigate each and every lead objectively. And what excuse did you get from the detectives in this case? Both Detective Isom and Agent Sanford with the FBI? Well, I didn't think it was relevant. So I didn't follow up. Everything in this case is filtered down for you, members of the jury. This is what the state is trying to do. Filter out all the facts that do not fit their theory and then only present you with what they believe is important. Sergeant Corbett looked at you and told you, I cannot tell you that these cell phone tower pings prove that Catherine McDonald was at a certain location. All he could testify to, well, it's consistent with her being in the area where the tower is located. Now, as much as Miss Dugan or Miss Kappelman came up here and said in their questions that Catherine McBanwell, when Catherine McBanwell took Sigfredo Garcia to rent the car, their car, their own expert told you they can't, no one can testify to that. There is zero evidence that proves beyond a reasonable doubt that Catherine McBanwell took Sigfredo Garcia to rent the car. They literally just want to say, well, it can't be a coincidence that she's pinging here in an area where one of her friends lives. And, oh, we also presented the rental agreement. Now, even though there's nothing there that says the time the car was picked up, we want you to rely on, you know, usually it corresponds with the due date. Literally in the rental agreement, there's a slot that says time in. But no, 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 assume, make the assumption, even though that that's blank, that, oh, this guy who came in here who says he doesn't independently remember anything, I'm sure you know that I would have done it 24 hours before. Everything is inference upon inference, assumption upon assumption for them to prove even one simple fact. One thing I can tell you, and I'm sure Ms. Kaplan will get up here and tell you, consistent with is not beyond a reasonable doubt, not even close. Maybe this is what happened. How many times did Ms. Kaplan get up here and say that in her explanation of the case? Well, maybe this is what was said, and probably, and I believe, all of those words are not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Every piece of circumstantial evidence in, in this case is consistent with Ms. McDonnell having zero idea or any involvement in Dan Markell's murder. Let's start with the Lexus. A 160,000 mile 2001 Lexus that he sold to her. Now the state wants you to ignore all the evidence that says she bought for it and that she paid it. They have zero evidence that says it was a gift. Think about it. Agents, think about Agent Sanford's reading that he gave you for that. Well, there's no corresponding withdrawal from that amount, so that means she never paid for it. There are text messages from the iCloud members of the jury. Mr. DeCoste had to bring them out through their witness, Mary Hall. Less than two weeks before the title transfer, they have text messages from Charlie Adelson's iCloud telling her to transfer the title into her name and that she paid $2,400 for it. It's there in black and white. Not only do they have that, they actually have the title transfer where her signature is on it, Harvey Adelson's signature is on it. That is the definition of what? A paper trail. Why didn't they show that to you? That is what you should be asking members of the jury. This is the state's burden. Why are they not giving you everything? That is a legitimate question. Why is it that they only get to show you the things that they think support their case? The only logical explanation is that it could just be proof of Katie's innocence, just like with the text about her paying for the car. They are the state of Florida. They're supposed to show you everything. If they were that confident in their case members of the jury, then why just not let you have everything? 
it should be very concerning to you that the prosecutors in this case are hiding things from you. Their act of hiding it alone proves that she is innocent. Next, let us talk about the breast augmentation. Now that is just flat out offensive. That both of these female prosecutors would argue that her surgery was payment for a homicide. Zero evidence at all that he paid for anything. She actually even brought up the June Unchinda statement that I don't even know. Oh, I think he may have said he, he paid for one. That is all they had. That's the evidence that they presented to you. Except that every other person says either Sigfredo paid for it or she paid for it. But let's see what they did. You follow up, right, with records. So they go to her doctor and subpoena her records. And what does it show? That she paid for it. Just because it's cash, it doesn't mean that she didn't pay for it. You heard from Catherine, the girl who was working multiple jobs, a single mother of two, to take care of her kids. And the state actually tried to make it seem like she's a bad person because she did one thing for herself. And we know it's true because Yendra, the state's own <coughs> witness, told you from day one, she's always wanted them. This is not something that is just a surprise to everybody. Poof, I went and I got breast enhancement surgery. And with all this evidence, they're still asking you to ignore that and just assume that this must be payment for a homicide? Now let's talk about the cash deposits. Okay, first we have our bank records from before she even knew Charles Adelson. She met him in the middle of 2013. Now mind you, they only went back six months. It's not like they got anything past that. But even then, before she met him, she's depositing cash the same way that she does in two separate bank accounts. There's, there's nothing unusual about that. She's always been doing that. She worked several different jobs that pay cash, including the ultimate cash-making field, the service industry. Anyone, including myself, who has worked in the service industry as a waitress, bartender, anything, knows it's an all-cash business. The state's own witnesses told you that Katie was paid in cash. But no, they spent hours and hours and hours in this trial trying to make it seem that the cash that she got was payment for a murder. Then they have the audacity to come into this courtroom and say, well, you know, there isn't really a record of her getting paid in cash. Well, there's maybe one check. Agent Sanford was told by Indra back in 2016, the name of the two clubs, the fact that Yindra actually worked there with her. And what does Agent Sanford do? He doesn't go to the clubs in 2016. That is what an objective agent would do. Let me go and see if this is true. This person that I went and is offering me information about Ms. Magdano tells me that she's working in an industry where she makes cash. And you just don't go and get the records? You literally wait until the worldwide pandemic hits in 2020 after she has already testified once before about everything. That is when Agent Sanford decides, you know what, let's go and check out those clubs. They actually take pictures of the nightclubs during the day, during the pandemic, when everything is shut down. Then Ramsey Neighbor comes in here and says, well, you know, uh, I had records, but there was a hurricane, and in the corner where all the records were, everything, you know, got flooded. And had he gone back in 2016, what would he have been able to get? The records. But no, they come in here four years later, because you know what Agent Sanford was trying to do? Because he's probably going to say, oh, you know, they're going to say I didn't look into this. Let me go and look into it now. It's too late. Everything is now gone. Because of you, the records are now lost. Katie never thought, oh my God, I have to gather evidence for myself from back in 2016 and keep records of this because the state is going to falsely accuse me of being involved in a murder. It's the agent's job, members of the jury, and the Tallahassee Police Department. They have the power and the resources to collect this evidence. Not to mention, Katie herself told you, Sigfredo would give her cash whenever he came into some. Why is it okay that Luis Rivera gave his sister money after the murder. She didn't get arrested. Why is it okay that he paid his mother's rent for a year with the money from the murder? 
She's not in jail. She didn't even come in here and testify. But no, when Katie does that, because the father of her kids gives her money, that's no, she's getting paid for a murder. That corresponds right around the time that Charles paid Sigfredo. And what does he do? I'm going to give money to the mother of my kids, who all she does is bombard me with the fact that I don't help her. And then the best part is, what does Katie do? What would someone do with cash that they received from a murder? Hmm. Let me see what I'm going to do with that so that no one ever sees it. I'm going to walk into the bank and deposit it so that everybody can see it, so that they can pull up all of these records and go, look, here is all her cash. There is zero records of Charles Adelson withdrawing cash, but they say he's guilty. There's zero evidence of either Luis Rivera or Sigfredo Garcia depositing their money in the bank. They're guilty. That just shows you that if you know that this money, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, members of the jury. You're not going to deposit it in the bank. She said that she's a well-educated college woman. There is no, you just put it under your mattress. Why are you going to walk into the bank and deposit money from a homicide so that everybody knows that it's there? Don't you see, members of the jury, everything she did is actually evidence that she did not know. Depositing the cash into her bank account, putting her name on the car transfer title with the name of Harvey Adelson as well. And then the one that the state actually thinks is evidence for payment of a murder, putting her on the payroll. Really? That's what you want the jury to believe. That Charles Adelson decided, you know what they're never going to find out? That they'll never find out that I'm paying Katie for this murder by putting her on the payroll. Common sense alone tells you, members of the jury, that that was not payment for a murder. Yindra told you exactly why Katie asked to be put on the, the, the payroll. There is text messages from the iCloud account corresponding exactly to the day when it is that she asked to be put on the payroll. There, it is there, black and white. And who had to show you those text messages? The people who don't have a burden in this case, the defense. We have, by law, the right to do nothing. We had to get up there and show you this evidence that supports her innocence. Another thing that they are hiding from you, there's no excuse for them not presenting it to you. What is Ms. Kaplan gonna come up here and tell you? Well, I didn't think it was relevant. Because that seems to be what the theme is in this investigation, turning a blind eye because I don't think it's relevant. And then they want you to come in here and say, well, she didn't go into the office, so as far as we can tell, she wasn't working there, in our opinion. It's just ridiculous. Katie herself got up on that witness stand and explained what it is. It's not a legitimate, like, nine-to-five job where she goes in. There are text messages that support that she is basically a personal assistant for him. He's doing a favor for her. And this is helping her get the insurance for her kids. Why, why, why would Katie get up on the stand and say those things if it wasn't true? Two years ago, the only person that has been consistent throughout this entire investigation is Katie. They knew about that back in 2019 and still are not able to produce any evidence that says she was not working there. It's, we didn't see it, so it didn't happen. We didn't see the communication, so it didn't happen. That's not how this works, members of the jury. Now, Katie said it best. Just looking at it from one angle, it looks bad. It does. Because when you just kind of look at the surface, you're like, these guys have no connection to these guys, and then oh, oh, they have one common denominator. But this is because Charles and Sigfredo made sure to keep their communication a secret. So Katie is the one that ends up being the easy way for the police to explain what happened. From this point on, Katie had no chance because she was now considered a suspect. And they zoned in on her and tried to build the case around her. So what do they do? Let's do an undercover operation so we can stir up some chatter. For one, let's talk about the blinders that the FBI put on while they were conducting this investigation, the bump. 
They already know that Sigfredo Garcia is involved. There's no question. They have probable cause to believe that he is the murderer at this time. And what do they do? They don't tap his phone. You know he is the murderer, and you don't tap his phone? I still not, I've not heard from one witness on the stand to give any reasonable explanation as to why you wouldn't be monitoring his phone. Willful blindness. Don't let Miss Kappelman get away with it. Have her get up here. She gets 10 minutes when she comes upon rebuttal and answer that question for you. A good reason. Don't let her give you an excuse. And if she can't give you one, that's reasonable doubt, members of the jury. All you are going to hear are excuses upon excuses upon excuses of why things are missing and you don't get to see them. Next was the gravest mistake that they made in this case. They planted Katie's name into the investigation. Instead of doing the bump and not mentioning any specific names and then seeing what happens, they say Katie and Tuto's name. He says it on the call. You can hear it, listen to it. You're gonna go back into the jury room and you can play it for yourself. The call from Charles Adelson to Catherine McManwell. My mom said it had to do with an ex-girlfriend. If it is not you, I'm going to feel stupid. He even says, as soon as I find out what this is, I'm gonna tell you what it is. I'll show it to you. Then the very next day, Dolce Vito. Now, members of the jury, I'm not gonna stand up here and tell you what I think Charles Adelson is saying in that audio recording. Listen to it for yourselves. When you go back into that jury room, and I am hoping you take this opportunity to remind you again of whose burden it is in this case. It is the state's burden. Because the fact that the state has to present a recording and constantly have to tell you what they think is, is happening is not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. You saw Ms. Dugan. That was half of her opening statement and half of Miss Kappelman's closing. Her adding words and making up sentences of what is going on in this conversation, speculating about what is being said and what she thinks Charles Adelson is talking about. Members of the jury, it's not your job to go back into that jury room and try to figure out what is being said. They should give you enough reliable, concrete evidence that there's nothing for you to figure out. That's beyond a reasonable doubt. It's not your job to try and make sense of the nonsense case that they have brought to you. If Ms. Dugan had any confidence in the strength of this piece of evidence, she would say, members of the jury, there'll be no question when you go back into that jury room. You listen to it for yourself. You're going to hear and there'll be no doubt in your mind that this is what they were talking about and they're conspiring about a cover-up with a murder. No, it's the opposite. Let me tell you what we think is happening there. Why is it that they're desperately trying to shove their interpretation of what is going on in that audio down all of your throats? Number one, just go listen for yourselves, members of the jury. You'll be able to go back there and listen to it for yourself. Why is he telling her that he hopes it's the cops? The state has not, is, uh, funny enough, out of all the things that they read, they leave that statement out. A statement they have really no logical explanation as to why he would be telling Katie, I hope it's the police. I want it to be, be the police because I, I didn't do anything wrong. Remember, members of the jury, in a criminal case, the benefit of the doubt goes to Catherine. When you are evaluating this evidence, the benefit of the doubt, you resolve it in favor of Catherine. She is presumed innocent. You heard it when the judge said it when he was reading the jury instructions. If there is any doubt about being said, you have to resolve it in favor of Catherine. Catherine gets the benefit of the doubt. They have the burden to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that they were in a conspiracy together. And not once do you hear Tallahassee, murder, Dan Markell, something definitive so that you know that that is what he is talking about. It speaks more that he doesn't mention it. Because if he did and she had no reaction, that would be strange. She told you, if he had said to me murder, then I would have remembered. 
But you want to know what is the most telling members of the jury? Believe it or not, it's Ms. McManwell. Ms. McManwell. Before this enhancement even existed, Katie subjected herself to cross-examination by Ms. Kaplan about that very meeting. If she wanted to lie, she would have right then and there. She had all the opportunity. She could have made up all types of things of what it was that he was saying to her because that's what guilty people do. Instead, she testified to the truth before even knowing what the enhancement was going to produce years later. And there is not one thing in her prior testimony that contradicts what is going on in that Dolce Vita video. Think about that, members of the jury. She testifies before the enhancement even existed. And they can't point to you one piece of evidence in her four hour questioning that says that contradicts what she said. She told you. She told them back in 2019. He was talking in circles, scenario after scenario. I'm trying to follow him. You can see for yourself in the Dolce video. It's just him. Yap, 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 yap. As much as they want you to try and guess what Ms. McBann was saying, that's not right. You know she's talking. They're asking you, they're the ones that say don't speculate, but they want you to speculate as to what Ms. McBannwell is doing and saying in response. How do you know she didn't say, dude, what are you talking about? Like, what's going on? You don't know that she didn't say that because they weren't able to record her voice. Always the focus of this investigation is getting to Charles, getting to Charles, getting to Charles. But no, don't focus the microphone on Catherine McBannwell. You don't even see her in the picture. And then all we have left after this investigation is a chopped up audio of just him talking at Ms. McBannwell. The state is so desperately trying to force their interpretation and view of this case onto you. But that is why you don't rely on them, members of the jury. Half of the things Ms. Dugan said in her cross-examination to Catherine about what Charlie said was flat out incorrect and misleading. Listen for yourselves, members of the jury. It is so obvious that he is, is doing exactly what Katie said he did years ago, talking in scenarios, trying to convince her to call this number and see if the guys will take the money. He keeps saying it's because they said your name. He's instructing her on what she, what she should say, all the while reassuring her that he has done nothing wrong. Simply put, this is not the conversation that would be had between co-conspirators to a homicide. All it proves is that she had no idea what was going on. And then to add insult to injury, they don't record all of the phone taps after the bomb. They don't. Oh, we had um, officers, you know, they were monitoring and taking notes. Once again, we have to rely on officers' determination of what they think is relevant and what they should recall. Why didn't they get the call detail records from the time of the bomb? We have to get them for you. When you go back into the jury room, take a look. There's a clip from the day of the bomb that we got from AT&T of Charles Adelson's records. There are three unexplained phone calls after the bomb. Now I know Ms. Kaplan tried to get up here and say, oh, Agent Sanford, who wasn't listening to the calls himself, what was that about? Oh, I think it was about work. Why not play it for you? Why not come in here and say, listen to all the calls? That is giving you all the evidence, members of the jury, so that you can sit and listen for yourselves instead of just viewing the things that they want you to see. We are here having to rely on office, what officers believe is important in this complex case or what they think is relevant. Because one thing I can tell you that I have learned from being involved in this trial, you cannot rely on someone else's interpretation of what is being said on a recording. Miss Dugan is the prime example of that when it comes to her masterful misinterpretation of what is being said on the Dolce Vita video. But that's all they are giving you as evidence mm -hmm. members of the jury. And on top of them not recording everything, they don't want to give you all of the phone calls. What is going on here? It's their wiretaps, it's their evidence. You saw the list of how many calls there were and the select few that they decided to play for you. Now I'm sure she's gonna come up here and say, oh, members of the jury, it's so much and we just gave you what we thought was relevant. 
How is that objective, members of the jury? And just to show you how unreliable this method of surveillance is, look no further than the wiretap between Sigfredo and Katie. Remember that one? Ms. Uh, Ms. Kappelman spoke about it, where she's saying, you don't tell me anything, Tuto, and he says, I'm not making that phone call. That phone call is minimized. You hear it when it goes, and then it picks back up again. Who in their right mind, who knows anything about this case, determines that's the call I'm going to minimize? They say that they're talking about the number. They're actually talking about what they believe is evidence of them having, and you minimize that call? That's lost forever. We will never know what was said on that phone call. And one thing I know that is clear to this day, Sigfredo tells Casey, one thing that's clear, thank God they turned it back on in time. The less you know, the better. Sigfredo Garcia is telling Catherine Magdano, the less you know, the better. Why, why, why would he be saying that to the mastermind middle person of the conspiracy? That's what they call her. And what is even more concerning is that the state is actively trying to present some of the recordings to you. That should be another current concern for reasonable doubt members of the jury. For what other reason would it be than because these calls don't fit their theory? The fact that they did not want you to have all the recordings in and of itself is reasonable doubt. And the most interesting part is they had their pick of the litter. They got to choose out of these 400 recordings what they thought would be beneficial to their case. And that's what they came up with. Out of all 400 recordings, those recordings that they play in here don't prove a thing. It proves that Catherine has no idea what's going on and that she's trying to do a favor for Charlie because that's all he does. She's probably trying to do it just like how Ryan Fitzpatrick said, just to shut him up. He said, that's why I stopped being friends with him because I just can't. He even said, Charles Adelson, it was such a great description will say things over and over and over again, a hundred different ways, a hundred different times, until you basically just give up and go, okay. That's probably why she said to him, yes, I'll call, and then doesn't call. If they're all in cahoots together, why is she lying to him? If she's really worried about what is going on here, that this might be the police, why is she lying to Charlie? So what, now they're not in a conspiracy? So they're in a conspiracy when it works for the state, but not in a conspiracy when it doesn't fit the evidence and what the recordings say. They cannot have it both ways, members of the jury. The only thing those recordings showed you is how guilty Charlie and Donna is. And where's Donna Adelson? At home in her living room, probably watching us right now live stream on that camera. She hasn't been arrested. I knew Ms. Kaplan would get up here and say, oh, don't worry about that. That's for a different day. And that... No, no, you can consider that. They come in here and tell you that they're going to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that these people are involved and that they conspire. And the only one of them that's in jail is Charles Adelson for the past month, like they just did it. Wendy Adelson, they actually brought her in here, members of the jury, and gave her immunity. You saw that horrible performance that she put on that witness stand. I mean, the fact alone that she even got up here and in her own way tried to play herself like she was a victim. She's there throwing in little jabs. Oh, well, you know, if he cared as much about me as he did. Like she's disparaging Dan Markell, her ex-husband that's been murdered. And then has the audacity to come in here and defend her family. You heard the testimony from Jeffrey Lacoste. I know you all heard that. I brought it out. There's more evidence against Wendy Adelson than there is against Catherine McManwell and they give her immunity. There is no question that those recordings had nothing on them. You want to know why? If there was anything on that, those recordings, anything at all that was direct reliable evidence, they would have put her in handcuffs immediately. And Charles too, back in 2016. Instead, what do they do? They release a probable cause affidavit unsigned, basically saying this is all speculation. We can't arrest them now. I thought they said that these recordings prove that she's involved in this murder, but it's not enough to even arrest her. Probable cause is down here. Beyond a reasonable doubt is up here. And then even though 
They're releasing this and they're still monitoring Katie's phone, okay? They don't play any of that. You know when they brought Detec uh, Detective Isom in here and they kept going on about, oh, we came to her house and we were trying to give her an opportunity. No, no, no. You showed up there unannounced, car parked down the street, no marked unit in her house, you don't identify yourself and you start banging on the door. There's a recording, they testified to it, of what Catherine was saying. They don't want to play it to you. Why don't they want to play it for you? So there could be no question about what's going on in her mind. We tried to introduce some of the calls, but we couldn't. So they got to pick what they wanted to play. Keep that in mind when you go back there. What is on those other recordings? Because you best believe. I object at asking the jurors to speculate about items not in evidence. Overruled. Because that's actually part of the instruction, members of the jury. The lack of evidence in the case can also be the reason that you find reasonable doubt. Then on May 25th, this is where they thought that they were going to, okay, may, we'll, we'll get her now, all right? We're still listening to her phone. May 25th, let's go and arrest Sigfredo. But the only thing we're going to release to the media is that Sigfredo Garcia was arrested for the murder of a Dan Markello in Tallahassee. They're still listening to Katie's phone calls. They haven't released a warrant, so no one should know that their phones are being tapped. And members of the jury, if she was part of this conspiracy and he gets arrested for the murder in Tallahassee, you don't think that there would have been something, something on those phone calls? Anything of cause of concern? Not her just crying and saying, I don't know what happened? That's not the conversations of someone in the know. And let me tell you, the fact that you don't have them alone lets you know that it doesn't fit their theory. Because if there was something on there, they would have played it for you. They're continuing monitoring our phone until June 3rd. And then after that is when the government decides, okay, we're trying all these things. We're doing this covert operation. Wiretaps are meant to catch people saying something incriminating. 400 recordings and nothing direct that says she's involved in a harm. 400. And they didn't record everything. Okay, so that didn't work. Let's go and arrest Sigfredo and see if she says anything. That doesn't work. All right, we're going to use the media as an investigative tool to try and obtain evidence of guilt against Ms. Magdano, never giving her the benefit of the doubt, never treating her like every other person in this case. You heard June Umchinja. She was dating Charlie. How come they went to her apartment, identified themselves, sat there and waited on her, said, oh, we'd like to talk to you, and treated her nice? Everyone else got that treatment. Jessica Rodriguez. Hey, listen, we need to get some information from you. Let's talk to you. Yindra, everybody. Katie, you go to our house, bang on our door, don't identify yourself, and then she never hears from you again. That's giving her a chance. That's treating her like a, you know, a witness, not a suspect. And that's the problem. They treated her as a suspect from day one. That is why they were so blind to all of the evidence that proved that she did not know. They release a 19 plus page report detailing how they believe Miss McManwell is the middle number, middle person. Just like Luis Rivera said, the mastermind. And as much as Miss Kappelman tried to mislead, mislead you into saying that she fled, you heard it yourself, members of the jury. We, the ones who have no burden, had to call back Detective Isom to the stand so that you could get the whole truth and nothing but the truth. What was that about? You're gonna get up here and then on redirect? Oh yes, she tried to flee. She knows better. She has all of the evidence. And then has, she literally comes to you and says, well, she fled to her brother's house and we didn't know where she was going. I thought you guys were watching her every move. Pull camera here. You have her phone. She didn't dump her phone. Go check her pings. She's right up at her brother's house. Wouldn't that be the next logical place to look? But no, she never gets the benefit of the doubt. She actually, the state actually tried to argue that that was evidence of guilt that she fled. But it's the opposite members of the jury. She stayed in Miami. Even after they went on the media with a 2020 episode for the entire nation to watch, accusing her of being involved in this. And she stayed. And you know what's part of it too, members of the jury? 
when you know you're innocent, you have this faith in the justice system. You believe, you, you have this feeling that, that our justice system doesn't do that. It's designed and built in a way that innocent people will not be punished for things that they didn't do. So she had that faith in the beginning. Okay, yeah, I know they're saying all this stuff, but I know I'm innocent. So there's no reason for me to run. And then what happens? The state becomes even more desperate. This is when they become desperate is when their objectivity becomes cloudy. Because they turn to the worst person, the most desperate person, to help with their investigation. Now remember the timeline of how they got his statement, members of the jury, because it is very important. They meet with him in August of 2016 in a very weird way. Jason Newlin, who we had to call to the witness stand, and Georgia, I mean Ms. Kappelman, is in one room, and Luis Rivera is in another room with his lawyers. And they're just asking questions back and forth. Oh, send a message over here, and then we'll send a message over here. That was all designed in a way to what effectively happened. No one has any idea about what was said in that meeting. Your first meeting of getting any information from Luis Rivera, the suspected murderer in this case, and you don't even take notes? Jason Newland comes up here, he's an investigator with the state attorney's office and tells you, yeah, I don't remember what happened. I just remember it didn't resolve in a plea. I think it had to do with the sentencing. What excuse is there for not writing down what he said? There's no excuse. Then September 30th, this is a month later, two months later, it's the day before Katie gets arrested. The detectives hear, oh, he's now cooperating. Go and take his proffer, his statement. And what do they do, members of the jury? It's inexcusable. We don't record proffers. I think one of them just said we don't do it, and someone else said the state attorneys told us not to record it. I still haven't heard a logical reasonable explanation as to why you wouldn't record that first interview of Luis Rivera, other than you don't want to record his mistakes. Don't listen to the excuses about policy and, oh, we don't do that. It's an excuse. There is no, the, the jail was equipped. The, the, the video you saw of the October 4th recorded statement is in the same jail that they met with him on September 30th. No excuses. They could have recorded it. But this was his dress rehearsal, members of the jury. And Detective Isom even told you himself when Mr. DeCosta was questioning him. But you said this, and you said, well, that's how I interpreted what he said. Why does everything have to go through the filter of these police officers? We wouldn't be sitting here if they recorded everything and you could see it for yourself. Because that's what I'd say, members of the jury, I don't even need to say anything to you. Watch it for yourself. But no, they don't want you. They don't want to make a record of all the mistakes that he made. And even with that, even with his practice session, he couldn't keep it right. Now, I think this is a great spot to just dig into Luis Rivera. Because even without the recording, I mean, I think there's no question here. He's a liar. He's a liar. It's offensive that the state of Florida brought that man into this courtroom and is going to ask you with a straight face to find him credible. I don't even know where to begin with the inconsistencies in his testimony. I don't care if he's been asked about this 10 times. You still can't get it right. It's difficult to remember a lie, members of the jury. But the truth, that remains the same. And no matter what he says or how many times they say it, they're actually going to tell you she said it. His only job was to tell the truth. Whose truth? Their truth? Because it's obvious he is not telling you the truth. Rivera, the judge just read you the jury instructions about cooperating witnesses. And that is some very strong <clears throat> language. Rivera, the man who was facing the death penalty for the murder of Dan Markell got 19 years to run alongside the 12 years he was already serving. So that's an additional no, seven years. And members of the jury, he's gonna get gain time for that. So it's less than seven years. He might be out this decade. Now, I know Ms. Kappelman kept asking all the witnesses, 
Oh, did you tell him what to say? And they said no. No one is saying that the detectives or the state said, here is a script, I need you to say exactly this, right? Because would, hopefully it would have been much better than that. That's not what we're saying that they did. What we're saying is, is that they left the crumbs there for him to pick up. It wasn't an invest objective investigation. The, from day one, we had to play a recording from you of Pat Sanford, all the way back in June, when they first met. And he says to him, we know Katie is in the one in the middle doing everything. Why would you say that? We don't need Garcia. We already have him. You don't think Rivera's like, ding. Okay, I know exactly what it is that you guys want from me. You only want Katie. Then Lewis has his discovery. It's obvious he didn't study it because even with the discovery, he can't get it right. Lewis, the guy who told you that he is the man that takes the deal and runs, the convicted Latin King gang member since he was 15 years old, that is who they are actually going to ask you to trust and find credible. Now the law says something different, and this is what I want you to look at. This is in the jury instructions. When you are evaluating the credibility of the witnesses in this case, number one, did the witness seem to have an opportunity to see and know the things to which he testified? Check. Did the witness seem to have an accurate memory? Not so much. Was the witness honest and straightforward in answering questions? Absolutely not. Even in the courtroom, he couldn't keep his story straight. Every time Mr. DeColes confronted him with something, he changed his story. Oh, would it surprise you if I told you that this and this? Yes, it would surprise me because we've spoken to you 10 times and you've never said it before. So yes, it would be a surprise. Did the witness have some interest in how the case would be decided? You're going to kill me. And if I say this, I get 19 years. So I get to go home to Jessica and my other baby mama and all my kids. Okay. Does the witness's testimony agree with the other testimony and evidence in this case? Absolutely not. He couldn't even get the fact that he drove on the first trip right. You remember when Mr. DeCoes confronted him with the traffic ticket? Trick it? Ticket? Oh no, Garcia drove the whole way up. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Let me show you something. Look at that. You're driving. You know what happened? We pulled over and switched seats. Forgot to tell you that. Right in front of you, that's the excuse that he came up with. He, that's how comfortable he is. He's like, as long as I just, the, what, it doesn't matter what comes out of my mouth. Because at the end of the day, as long as he keeps coming here and at saying the bare minimum, he's going to get his deal. Well, has the witness been offered or received money, preferred treatment? He's in the feds on a state sentence. Has any pressure or threat been used against the witness? What's interesting is Mr. Rivera himself told you that all of a sudden now, even though he claims this has nothing to do with the Latin Kings, they're all trying to kill him. Oh, I'm, I'm in danger, I'm in threat, oh, poor me, poor me. And that somehow anybody in this courtroom should feel sorry for him. But he is feeling that pressure. Did the witness at some time make a statement that is inconsistent with the testimony he or she gave in court? I mean, I don't even need to go through all of that. Has the witness been convicted of a felony? 10 times. It's actually there in the jury instruction. Does the witness have a general reputation for dishonesty? Jessica Rodriguez said it. She knows him. He's a lifelong Latin King gang member. His existence and job is to lie and just to get what's good for him. He cares about nobody else. Just a couple things he couldn't get right, which are, are things that you should know. Two guns or one gun? Don't know. One trip? Two trip? Now? Three trips. He came into, oh yeah, 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 there was a third trip. I told Jason Newland and I said that. No, you didn't. Because they testified and said, never said anything about that. Now, with respect to the phone call that Garcia makes to Katie, telling her it's done, and he claims that he hears her say, I know. Members of the jury, there's no way that Katie would have known at that time. Zero possibility. Remember, their whole thing is we have all the records. 
oh, Charles and Sigfredo couldn't be communicating because we can't see it there. So it didn't happen because we can't see it. They have all of Wendy Adelson's records. They showed you. She even tried to present it. Mr. Nicole's caught her. Look at the time that Wendy Adelson drives over to Trescott. The calls already happened. So if they were trying to insinuate that maybe Wendy found out and that she told someone and then that somehow that trickled down to Wendy, if that happened, members of the jury, with their summaries and their charts and their flow charts, you would have seen it. They would have done a nice little cute slideshow for you and put it up here of how that information would have traveled to Katie. It's not there. It's because Luis Rivera is lying. It is impossible that she would have known about the shooting. There's nothing there to suggest. There's no calls to Charles Adelson. They have all of Wendy's phone records. They have all of Charles' phone records, including his iCloud. That is how you know that he is lying. And she still gets up here and is asking you to take that as evidence and to believe Luis Rivera. He's lying, members of the jury. And we also know that even the state doesn't believe Mr. Rivera. Look at how many times he tried to give them Wendy Adelson. He knew that's what they wanted. He actually testified that he saw her on the street with two boys the day before the murder. He said, I saw them walk into the house. Impossible. They have Wendy's records. And the boys were in daycare at the time that he said that this took place. If they believed Rivera in any way, shape, or form, why hasn't Wendy been arrested? That's proof that he said, oh, she's here to make sure we're up here doing the job. Why is she not in jail? So he's lying about that. But no, 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 believe him whenever he presents you with any evidence that's supposed to prove Katie is guilty. That it doesn't work that way, members of the jury. How can you trust anything that comes out of his mouth? If you believe him, go and arrest her <coughs> instead of having her come in here under a, a guise of immunity to sit down and lie in front of you, because that's what she did. The only thing, believe it or not, that Rivera even managed to get right were the details of the shooting. Like the fact that Dan Markell's window was up when he was shot, or the fact that he put his hand up, or that he was on the phone. I thought he was sitting in the driver's seat. Look at the picture that they have from the garage with the door open. It's from the, the back of the garage. You can't see anything. How does he know that? If he's a pat, what are they going to say? Oh, Garcia came in and said, hey, listen, the windows were up. And he was on the phone. And this was no. We all know what that means. Why do you think he was so quick to jump at the deal first? Let me get out of, let me get in there quick. Say that he's a shooter and I'm going to get my deal. It doesn't really matter, though. They're both guilty, Sigfredo and, and Lewis. Whether they're both in the car, it doesn't matter who shot. But just to let you know the type of person that Luis Rivera is, those are the things that he gets right, because that is something that he saw for himself. Don't you see what is happening here, Katie? I mean, members of the jury. <laughs> what the plan was, Lewis was to give us Katie, Katie will give us Charlie, and there we go, it would work. And that would have worked, members of the jury, if she were guilty. You heard it from Katie herself from the day that she was arrested. This is why Detective Isom and Agent Sanford came down to Miami the day after they were with Luis Rivera all day. They wanted her to cooperate. This is why Isom would not give me the warrant. And then to top it off, he lies to you about it. Why do you think we had to call Sherry Bennett to the stand? Because she's the one that got the warrant signed. And what did she tell you she did? She emailed it to Detective Isom. Why is Detective Isom not giving Catherine's lawyer a copy of the warrant? I'm her lawyer. And then he lies to you and says, oh, I couldn't give it to her. I have email. Oh, I didn't have a hard copy. You can email it to me. Excuses, excuses, excuses. And worse, you've got one officer saying something that contradicts what Detective Isom is saying. All I had when I went and met with her was the information that Rivera was cooperating. Members of the jury, if she were guilty, she would have cooperated that night. 
She was already in handcuffs in Broward lockup. Your lawyer comes to you and goes, hey, listen, all I know is Rivera is cooperating. If she knew about this and knew that Rivera was cooperating and was in the middle, she'd be like, okay, what would you like me to tell you? Do I get to go home? All right. We know how desperately they wanted Charlie. But they refused to even think or contemplate the possibility that she didn't know. There is no reasonable explanation at all why she wouldn't cooperate immediately if she were guilty. If not then, why not every day for the past six years? It's because cooperate to them means to tell their truth. Both Sanford and Newlin said it. Cooperate means to tell us the truth. But who determines what that truth is? And what is not? They do. And you know how we know this? Because Ms. Kaplan told you, she sat down with Ms. McBanwell in the jail. Invitation by the defense. Any lawyer will tell you in a, that never happens, that you're gonna let the prosecutors under no promise of immunity, nothing. That's how confident we were that she was innocent. I, we have nothing to hide, come and talk to her. And then Ms. Kaplan has the audacity to come up here and say, that meeting was a joke. Why, because she didn't say what you wanted her to say. She's been in jail all this time, and it was a joke. It wasn't a joke to Miss McDonald. None of this is a joke. And for her to get up here and deminimize what that was, and then assume, actually argue to you that that was somehow some defense strategy, that I would somehow know that Miss Kaplan would go, oh, I think your, your, your client's lying, so I can use this in the future as some form of argument. Like, I knew that we would be sitting here in this courtroom Years later, it's a ridiculous, ridiculous argument to make that that was somehow planned so that we could use it in the future. That makes no sense. She could have sat there and not said a word. She did, they didn't even have to come over, but no. Come over, that's how confident I am, and I will tell you everything. She's spoken to them now three times, members of the jury, three times. And unlike Rivera, nothing in her testimony has changed. Nothing. Have they brought out to you any piece of evidence that says, hey, listen, she said this one time or, and it doesn't fit here? Not one. You want to know what the inconsistency is? When someone tells you that they're in Tallahassee, they take a picture of an owl and put it on their Instagram and then come back later and goes, you know what the picture was of? A lion. He literally sat here and said, oh yeah, I took a picture of a lion in the middle of Tallahassee and posted that on Instagram. You notice Miss Kaplan completely left that out when she was talking to you about the Instagram post. Now all of a sudden it's an Instagram post. Not the fact that he couldn't even get the animal right. They're not even in the same, he couldn't even pick another bird. He went lion. The only person from day one that's been consistent is Katie. And you learned through the, throughout the course of this trial that Katie not only waived that, that right once, but twice and now three times. We all discussed how important it was, members of the jury. We talked about this at length, about why people don't take the stand and how you can't use that against them. And one of the main things you saw, how nervous she was when she first started testifying. All eyes on her. And she said it to you herself. I know everyone is hanging on everything that comes out of my mouth. My life depends on this. That is why she sits there and, and she wants to be, she wants to remember, but they're asking her about text messages and things that happened so many years ago. She had nothing to, this is why she can't remember. Her entire life has just been there for the entire world to see. Who she was sleeping with? All out there? The state making these arguments about how she's a, a bad person for getting birth surgery? For the world to see? And then she elects to do it again? And she told you herself, she didn't have to get up there. She did not have to get there, especially after that Luis Rivera performance. But she wanted you to hear it out of her mouth. 
I had nothing to do with the murder of Dan Markell. Now, no matter how much Miss Dugan tried to bully her, because that's what that was, members of the jury. Why are you asking her the same question over and over and over again? Like, she didn't even change it up. The same question over and over, expecting a different response. They thought that that was what, effective cross-examination? What, they thought that she'd eventually just wear down and just say, oh, okay? Getting frustrated with Katie when she wouldn't agree with her misinterpretation of the evidence, because that's what she did. She tried to get Miss McBanwa to commit to what she believes Charles Adelson was saying. She even went so far at one point, I know you all saw it, to misrepresent Katie's prior testimony. You saw me fly out of my seat and say, that is not what she said. She did it twice. Now, I'm not sure if she thought we wouldn't catch it. She literally misread Catherine's words to you. That is how desperate they are, members of the jury, to try and piece together this nonsense of a theory to try and sell to you that this is evidence of guilt of Miss McDonald. It's not right members of the jury what they're doing. It's not. As a prosecutor, they should not be trying to skew things for you. They have a different obligation of presenting the evidence to you, all of the evidence. Why are they tailoring it and leaving things out to fit their theory? It's, that's not how this is supposed to go. And another thing, if Katie wanted to lie, she had every opportunity to do so back in 2019. Mm -hmm. She could have been like Luis Rivera. Oh no, I remember the exact day Sigfredo Garcia brought me money on July 19th, 2018, that day. She could have sat up there and said it. All the evidence is up there that said it happened that day. But she didn't lie to you. She didn't. I don't remember what day it was. That's an honest answer, members of the jury. Her life is on the line and she could have just peppered in all of these little facts. She doesn't remember because she's been sitting in a jail cell for six years. She told you herself she had COVID twice. And she still has to get up here and try to remember things that happened in 2014. Now, in opening statement, I told you, and the state, I told them as well, exactly what happened in this case. And it's right there in the evidence, members of the jury. We are the ones that had to bring it to you. The defense had to put the pieces together. The state is the one that is to give you enough pieces of credible evidence to create a picture of what happened so that you can see it clearly. What they have done is picked out what pieces they think fit their theory, throw it into a pile and said, you guys go back there and try to put the pieces together and figure it out. That is not how the criminal justice system works. That is not beyond a reasonable doubt. The state has to give you enough evidence, reliable, credible evidence, so that when you guys go back there, you can confidently say, yes, she did this. That's what proof beyond a reasonable doubt is. And they have failed miserably. And it's because what they think happened is so wrong. The pieces don't fit. June herself told you that when Katie was arrested, Charles said, they got it wrong. Just talking about her. That's why he was so shocked, so shocked and surprised. Like, how could she get arrested? Because he knew she had nothing to do with it. So what supports what we told you happened in this case? We all agree that Charles Adelson is the one behind the murder of Dan Markell, and that Sigfredo and Lewis committed the murder. We know that Sigfredo Garcia was actively following Katie when she was dating Charlie. That did not just come out of Katie's mouth. That also came out of all of the state's witnesses. Ryan Fitzpatrick, Yindra Velasquez, Jessica Rodriguez, every single one of their, their witnesses said that this is what um, Sigfredo Garcia would do. And it just so happens that the night they met was the night with the dinner with Jeffrey Lacoste. Jeffrey told you he was having dinner with Wendy and Katie and outside. Now, Ms. Kavamo wants you to believe that when Luis Rivera says, oh yeah, 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 I was with him one time when he tried to run him over, he said that was in Brickell. For any of you who are not from Miami, Brickell is a whole different place than South Beach. That's just 
a different occasion of when Sigfredo Garcia, that's how much he would follow her members of the jury. But on this night, they were sitting outside. It's right there in the text messages that he was watching her. Look at that, members of the jury. This is a text from Katie to Charles Abel. The next day, I guess, I don't know, he called me and said, have a nice dinner and to never call him again. I'm like, WTF. It's obvious, because this is Charles Adelson's iCloud, so you can't assume that she's responding to anybody else but Charles. Why is Charles Adelson asking Katie the next day about Sigfredo? It's obvious that that's who she's, he's talking about. Why is he asking her that? He's trying to see if Garcia told Katie anything about their meeting. And that response let him know, nope, he never told her. So now he was in the clear. Then a month later, you see evidence again that they were communicating. Now, just because the state wants to be able to say, hey, let me give you a call detail record so I can show you flurries <coughs> of communications between Charles Adelson and Sigfredo Garcia, because of course they'd use their original phones to commit a murder, right? A month later, Katie to Sigfredo, Doug to Charlie, did Tuto call your phone? He then responds, no. Then, actually he did. He invited me to go deep sea fishing. He was so nice. Now we all know he's being sarcastic. But you see the reference he uses that he, when he's talking about Sigredo Garcia, deep sea fishing, really? We all know what that means, mob terms, send them to the fishes. That's how narcissistic Charles Adelson is. He, that's the joke he decides to, yeah, 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 I'm, I admit, it's, he's being sarcastic, but that's his little way of putting in there, oh yeah, yeah, we're going deep sea fishing. What does Casey say? I'm serious, he's driving me crazy. Is your cell phone online? Why would she ask him that? Other than she's going through Sigfredo's phone and sees Charles Adelson's phone number in there. That is the only logical explanation. Is your cell phone number online? Did Tuto call your phone? She didn't say is your work number online. Is your cell phone number online? And he goes, no. She was going through his phone and saw that. But then of course, what does Charles do? He lies to her. No, no, no. So okay, my worry is gone. She was probably thinking, oh my God, why is Charlie's number in Sigfredo's phone? But what do these men always do when it comes to Katie? They just shut her up. I don't know what you're talking about. No, that, that didn't happen. And she didn't go any further. Well, the state didn't introduce all of the iCloud, but we were able to show you these. Then Luis Rivera makes a trip up here in June. And I only say that because there literally is nothing that puts Garcia on the trip in June. Nothing. Oh, we didn't happen to get the cell phone records for Sigfredo. Really? No records from the hotel? You got the hotel records from the second trip. Luis Rivera, budget in, two people staying there. But he supposedly stayed at the budget in on the first trip. You didn't get no records. What excuse did you get again? Oh, we were digging through an attic of paperwork and couldn't find it. Excuses. Then they said, mentioned something about a drug dealer saw him here. Did a drug dealer besides Luis Rivera testify in this courtroom? No. And the murder doesn't happen in June. Charles had all intentions of breaking up with her. You will see in the text messages, members of the jury, when Charles says, when Charles says to his friend, Solly, they're going on a trip to the Keys. This is in June. This is the goodbye tour. He was going to start breaking up with Katie, assuming that the murder was gonna go down. That is why Garcia was so mad when he saw them together on July 1st. It's a couple weeks later that Dan Markell is murdered in cold blood in his driveway. 
And then what's even more telling members of the jury? Just like that, right after the murder, the communications are no longer romantic. I just want to be friends. You really gonna break up with the girl or that you just conspired to commit murder with? There's not one thing in his text messages, nothing that supports. They have all of his text messages from the day of the murder, the day after the murder, the day before the murder. They don't show that to you because there's nothing in there that shows that she knew anything about the homicide. In fact, the conversations are just so obscure that that's not the conversation that people would be having knowing that a homicide is going to take place. Now, they also make this big deal about how, oh, look, the cell phone towers say that, oh, she's driving up to Yindra and she's gonna drop off the kids because she needs to go what? If she was planning this murder and knew it was going to happen, you don't think she would have made plans to have someone else watch the kids way in advance? I'm just gonna wait on the night of and try to get Yindra to watch the kids then? That is the planning that's taking place in this, in this homicide? That she has to get the day of the murder Yindra to watch her kids? And she told you, he told me that his brother was in a car accident. She doesn't even remember him saying that because that was just nothing. But what does he tell June and everybody else? My, ex, my uh, ex-brother-in-law was murdered. He never says that to her, never. And let's not forget the day after the murder because they're trying to paint this picture that Katie came and delivered money for the murder from Charles to the hitman. First you hear, first of all, the only evidence to that is Jessica Rodriguez and Luis Rivera. They can't get their story straight. As much as, much as they tried, as much prepping that probably went on, even they couldn't get their story straight. Luis, I was at the barber shop when Jessica called me. The records directly contradict that version of events. He actually tried to get on the stand and for the first time say to you, oh, I gave Anthony Ortiz my phone. That's why I'm pinging down here. That's the first time he's ever said that. Do you see what happens when you confront him with something that, does, that contradicts what he's saying? He just on the fly tries to, to fix it. And then I thought Ms. Kaplan just got up here and said that that number is Jessica Rodriguez's number. Isn't it Anthony Ortiz's number? Whose number is it? They actually put up the, the, the demonstrative and it still says Anthony Ortiz. But she comes up here and goes, well, it's saved as Jessica. Whose phone number is that? They're supposed to prove to you and have those questions all resolved. But no, 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 it's okay, members of the jury, just, you know, this person says it's this number and this person, we still don't know whose number that is. And if you believe Luis Rivero, that that was Hibaro or Anthony Ortiz, you don't get those phone records to see if maybe he was with Luis Rivero on the first trip? You don't get those phone records to see if maybe there's some, it's willful blindness, members of the jury. He is, that number is actively in the midst of their flurry of communications. And you don't get the phone records? And then, Jessica Rodriguez. First of all, Miss, I want nothing more to do with this case. I wonder why. I'm not even gonna waste too much time on her because that nonsense that she came in here with, you heard what she said to Lewis in that email back in June, the same day that the cops came to speak to her. No matter what, from this point forward, I will do what I can to make sure you come home. You keep that crown on your head. That's what she says to him. After she just lied to Sherry Bennett or whoever it was that came and interviewed her in June. I don't know anything about anything, nothing to do with Kututo and Katie and none of that. But then what happens when Luis Rivera needs someone to back up his story so that he can get his 19 year deal? Oh, I remember this time when they came to my house. Now, they're gonna try their best to try and pigeonhole it to the 19th. Oh, she said one month, two. She said August and September. We played it for you. She's got the days wrong. Then she's all over the place. Oh, I thought it was a brick. You heard what Ryan Fitzpatrick said about the money. It's $100,000, all in hundreds. That's what Luis Rivera said, stapled. That's not a brick, okay? That's not a brick of cocaine. And then she, on top of that says, Completely different from what Luis Rivera says. Oh, I asked her if what was in the bag. I don't know. But then now wants to come in here and change her story again and say something different than what she said before. That is what they brought to you, members of the jury. 
That is what they brought to you as direct evidence to try and prove that Katie was involved. But no matter how hard they tried, there is not one piece of credible evidence, reliable evidence, that was presented to you as jurors that would allow you to go back into that jury room and say confidently that this is what happened. The only evidence was Luis Rivera, and he is a walking contradiction. Look at what the law says you must consider in this case. Oh, no, I think I already had That's all right. The law also spells out for you where reasonable doubt comes from. It comes from the evidence itself, the lack of evidence, and the conflicts in the evidence. Members of the jury, this, their case, their theory, is littered with all three. Their theory in this case conflicts with reason and common sense. That is reasonable doubt. And then the one major concern that you should have is that the state is actively withholding evidence from you. That should always be a question in your mind, members of the jury. Why? We, by the letter of the law, do not have a burden of proof. We do. We do not have a burden of proof. But this, that chart, <laughs> actively reflects what the burden of proof is in this case and what beyond a reasonable doubt really means. When my team actually gets it up, it will just leave it up there, OK? But this is the truth. This is what it is. This is all not guilty members. Maybe something happened. Suppose, I believe, all of that is not beyond the reason. Probably guilty, not beyond the reason of love. Likely guilty, not beyond the reason of love. All the way up there, that's how high the burden is. You cannot go back into that jury room and say, I think this is what happened, or I believe this is what happened. Not in a criminal case when someone's liberty is on the line. Now remember, Ms. Kappelman gets to get back up here and do a rebuttal. And I'm going to challenge her right now, because I don't get to come back up again. I want her to come up here and present you with one piece, one, just one piece of solid, reliable evidence. In this case, that doesn't require her interpretation, her speculation, her inference. Something that's just not a coincidence, or maybe this has not happened. Something that isn't this is consistent with. And she's not going to be able to come up here and present you with one piece of this mountain of evidence that has been introduced in this case. That is evidence that is proof beyond a reasonable doubt that she needs. I challenge her to come up here, point to one thing, and show it to you. And if she comes up again and does, does not show that to you, and just ignores my question and ignores my that alone, members of the jury lets you know that she's got nothing. She's gonna come up here and try to give you the runaround and how they wish they could get better evidence and how I, I don't get to pick my witnesses and it's not my fault. That's a not guilty. One piece of direct evidence that is not Luis Rivera. Something that is not, what, I mean, they have hundreds of thousands of text messages, 400 plus recordings. When have you ever seen an investigation of this magnitude that didn't yield something direct? Look at the evidence against Luis Rivera and Sigfredo Garcia. That's evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. There's no question that they were up, in, up, up, up there and that they went upon that trip. The Prius, like, I could even make an argument, but no, they, they shut that down because of the unique characteristics on the Prius. That's what separates that Prius from any other Prius in Miami-Dade. Every possible reason that you could have tried to explain to say, maybe it's not them, they covered their bases. I'll give them that. That's proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And remember, they're charged as a principal. So it doesn't matter which one of them shot, the, shot Dan Markell, okay? So that is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. They have nowhere near brought you anything close to that where you can say, yes, Miss McDonald had something to do with it. And that's because she is innocent. That's why, members of the jury, that evidence doesn't exist because she is not guilty. That is how Ms. McMahon was sits here today, living the worst nightmare that anyone on this planet could imagine. Sitting in a jail for a crime you did not commit. 
knowing all the while that all you have to do to go home is lie. I'm involved and Charlie got me to do this. She got her pair and told you herself, I believe he's guilty. I want him to pay for what he did to Dan Markell and also for getting me involved in this nonsense. And all she'd have to do is lie, members of the jury. That's it. But she's not Luis Rivera. No matter what she did, she has stuck to the truth every single time. And she's not going to sink to his level just to buy her freedom. This is another question that Miss Kaplan, when she gets back up here, is not going to be able to answer you. Why in the world would Catherine not cooperate if she were guilty? Why? She's going to come up here and speculate, maybe this and that. She told you you can't use speculation. What evidence can she show you to say is a legitimate reason why? If she knows that's all they want, if she were guilty, why wouldn't she take the deal? Why? She's going to sit in jail and take her chances on a first degree murder case with two other first degree solicitation and conspiracy charges? You heard Luis Rivero, that he was, he was facing the death penalty on one of those charges. I'm not saying she was, but that's just to show you the level of severity that she is facing. And all she would have to do is just say, yeah, I'm gonna tell you your truth. And she could go home. But she's not Luis Rivera. If she does not come up here, Ms. Kaplan, and give you that explanation, something reasonable, something that's based on evidence, it's not guilty, members of the jury. Because there's no reasonable explanation why a guilty person wouldn't take that deal. That is evidence of her innocence. And members of the jury, please, I beg of you, remember that oath that you took at the beginning of this case, the promise you made to look at the evidence in this case objectively. That's what we've been waiting on. We need objectivity. I told you, and so did the judge, leave everything that you thought that you knew about this case at the door. I saw you all waiting during the case at the edge of your seats, waiting for the state to bring you, like she says, the smoking gun that she was involved. Where, where's that? Where? Was it Luis Rivera? The worst witness to have ever existed on the face of the planet. I have never seen anything like that before in my life. They're asking you to convict Miss McBannell on the word of a man who has proven to be nothing more than a liar and who only cares about himself. You are the jurors in this case. You saw the evidence that they brought into this courtroom. That is what you have to base your decision on, the evidence that you saw here. Leave everything outside the door, members of the jury. This is us in here now. We have all been through this together, all of us. The judge, everyone. But it's what it is that you learned, because that's the evidence in the case. Not what's out there in the media, not what is other people's interpretation of what they believed happened in this case. I'm sure you expected way more when you came in here on this case. I'm sure you expected to be like, oh wait, uh, they're gonna give me something. And that's what they gave to you. That unreliable word of Luis Rivero, and nothing more. Go back and listen to the Dolce Vita. I, that's how confident I am. Because I know for a fact there's nothing on there, because she is innocent. Justice for Dan Markell is not convicting an innocent person of this crime. In fact, it would be a travesty of justice to convict Ms. McBanwell of any of the charges in this case. She is across the board not guilty. And remember, members of, she had nothing to do with this. That's what we're telling you. Nothing, no part of it. The state is throwing all of these charges at you, hoping and praying that you, just one of them will stick. That's all they want, just one. But I'm telling you, she is not guilty of all three. Because if she didn't know, members of the jury, she's not guilty. You cannot convict her for having awful taste in men. You cannot convict her because the father of her children is a scumbag. You cannot convict her because she ended up dating Charles Adelson, probably one of the worst human beings on the face of the planet. She didn't know members of the jury. And what the evidence in this case has proven to you is that she is not guilty of every single count. Please take the time to evaluate the evidence in this case. We have come 
this far, I'm confident that when you all sit there and you go over everything for yourself, you're going to see that she didn't do this, members of the jury. She's innocent. Find her not guilty. Thank you, Ms. Claus. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kaplan, state rebuttal. You have yes, 10 sir. minutes. So unfortunately, I cannot take up Mrs. Kowalski's uh, invitation to explain to you why it is that criminal defendants choose to exercise their constitutional right and take a case to trial as opposed to doing a deal or taking a plea offer. Maybe she thinks she has very talented lawyers. Maybe she thinks she has a good chance of walking out of here. Maybe she thinks if she gets convicted, she'll offer to do something for me then. We'll see how that goes. Maybe she's getting a big payoff. Maybe somebody's threatened to do something to her. I don't know. And that's not important. I don't have to prove that to you because it's not an element of the offense in this case. Y'all really have to focus on what are the elements and have those been proven. A lot of the things that were suggested to you that I haven't proven, I don't have to prove. So I want to make sure you take a look at those elements when you get back there and think about what evidence do we have in this case to each one of those elements? The defense says none, there's nothing, we've just been sitting here for 10 days and nothing has occurred. That's going to be up to y'all. Did the case get proven? Was the evidence any good? That's up to you collectively and individually as jurors. Am I hiding things? Am I filtering things? You cannot speculate on items that did not come into evidence. The judge is the filter. What comes into evidence? This stuff over here and the testimony, you guys have to base your verdict on that. And if that's not enough, then it's insufficient evidence, lack of evidence. That can give rise to a reasonable doubt. But as far as, oh, we tried to get in this thing and y'all didn't get to hear it and they're hiding it and it must be something really good, that's speculation. That item is not in evidence because it was not admissible and you cannot speculate about it. Please do not accept their invitation to do that. The judge has instructed you that a reasonable doubt is not a mere possible doubt, a speculative, imaginary, or forced doubt. Such a doubt must not influence you to return a verdict of not guilty if you have an abiding conviction of guilt. So y'all have to really assess what is reasonable when you're back there. And you were chosen because you have common sense and you know how to do that. It's not magic. Um, I want to address some of the coincidences that really you have to buy in order to buy the defense theory in this case. I mean, everyone sort of agrees. You look at it and you think, yeah, she's in the middle. In order to buy the defense's theory that this evidence is not as it appears, you have to find that there are several things that are coincidences. And I'm sure you can think of a lot more, but I wrote down a few. Fact one, the defendant went to the rental car place. Okay, I mean, there's evidence she went to the rental car place. She says, no, I was visiting Kenya. But God, what a terrible coincidence that she's visiting Kenya both times that the rental car is getting rented and returned. Fact two, the money spike in this case. And you all have seen repeatedly that graph with the big spike in her cash that occurs right around the time of this murder. And she says this is not as it appears. I worked in the club, I made a lot of money, I happened to have the best month ever that month that Dan Markell was murdered, but that has nothing to do with me. The cash spike is not evidence of a crime. It's a coincidence. Or Sigfredo Garcia gave it to me, but remember that Yinder told you that the defendant went after Sigfredo Garcia for child support in January of 2015. So it's a little unbelievable that after, remember she said, getting a thousand bucks from him would be a very significant amount of money. If she had just gotten, what is it, 13, 14, 17 thousand dollars from him between the murder and October the year prior, would she be going after him for child support in January of 2015? Is that just a 
you know this money situation is this just a terrible coincidence for her is it a terrible coincidence for her that she got placed on the payroll of the adelson institute and it just happened to be right after the murder and it just happens to be that she really doesn't seem to be able to tell us what she did for it fact three rivera flipped on her he did he flipped he told what he knew and she went under the bus as a result well He's making up his testimony to comport with the reports in the case. He's a liar, he's a gangster, he's a thug. You shouldn't believe him. And she's just the unlucky victim of his made up story to frame her. He's a liar, as are all the witnesses in the case, right? I mean, they're all, they, they kind of have to all be liars. Why didn't I just have Luis Rivera, since I'm also a liar and a crook, who's trying to pull the wool over your eyes. Why didn't I just have Rivera say, Garcia did it, I mean Garcia, Charlie Adelson did it. Why didn't I just do that? I'm desperate to get Charlie Adelson, aren't I? I'm laying awake at night, wanting to do this trial again. Why don't I just get Rivera to say whatever I want? That's what I'm doing, aren't I? Fact five, deep sea fishing, or maybe I'm on four. Four, deep sea fishing. Look at this text, they, they made a joke about deep sea fishing. The problem is, and we published State's Exhibit 133, a clip from the defendant's prior testimony where she admits that was a joke. I am unaware of any evidence that Garcia and Rivera are in direct communication, and I'm not sure why my lawyers were trying to make it look like there was a connection between those two. She didn't even get what they were trying to do. Fact five, this is the biggest fact. I mean, she is literally in the middle. She is got a baby daddy who killed Dan Markell and a boyfriend who hired the hit. And she is to have you all believe that that is a coincidence. Her child's father having nothing to do with her happened to murder the brother-in-law of her boyfriend. It is often said that the best explanation is the simplest one. So we're up to five, and I'm sure you can think of more explanations for the appearance of this case. Or one explanation, one that is simple and explains everything, and is, I think, very well articulated and proven by the evidence that y'all have <laughs> been held hostage and forced to listen to and see for the last 10 days. How many coincidences does it take for it to no longer be a coincidence? I want to talk about the defendant's own words. She sent a text message to Charlie Adelson in 2015 that says, next time, don't be such a dick to someone that has done something for you. Where's the What has she done for him? We have problems sleeping and shit. We do have a lot of weight on our shoulders. Remember what Donna Adelson said to June Umchinda out on the balcony that day? She feels like Dan is haunting her from the grave. The weight of this thing is heavy on these people. The weight of this crime is inescapable and it is squarely on this defendant's shoulders. She didn't come to Tallahassee. I can't give you a picture of her in Tallahassee. I can't put her in the Prius because she wasn't in the Prius. She didn't come to Tallahassee. She didn't pull the trigger. But she's as guilty as everyone else that had a part in this crime. 
no amount of playing dumb, no amount of criticizing the cops and the investigation. If the facts aren't on your side and the law aren't on your side, attack the prosecutors. Attack the witnesses. Attack the cops. Attack the investigation. No amount of excuses and explanations for the evidence in this case can change it. The truth is the truth. The evidence is what it is. The defendant has asked for your sympathy, and you may have felt sorry for her yesterday. We talked about sympathy at jury selection. It is sad. It's sad for everybody involved. But the judge has instructed you that your verdict must not be influenced by feelings of sympathy. You have to separate that out. In her own words, those are the most damaging pieces of evidence in this case, not the words of the Katie that you saw on the witness stand yesterday, but the Katie that you met in those phone calls. It's getting too detailed. That's call Z. It's getting too detailed. It's somebody that knows for sure. Or call GG. It's not from the inside because there's too much from the inside that the other person knows from the outside. That's why I know for a fact it's not from the inside. It's somebody trying to be greedy. Her own words are the thing that hangs her worse than anything else y'all have seen. Defendant says everyone has their own versions of the truth. I want Rivera to say my truth, his truth, her truth. No, there's only one truth. And that's what you all are going to decide in a few moments. One truth, which is determined by the evidence. One verdict in this case that speaks the truth. What Catherine Magdalena is going through is not the worst nightmare that anyone can imagine. Her being compelled to answer for what she did in this case, for what she set into motion, that is not the worst nightmare that anyone can imagine. This is what this case is about. Find her guilty. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Ms. Kaplan. Okay, I'm going to read the last instruction to you. So if you go to page 11, please. <coughs> In just a few moments, you will be taken to the jury room by the bailiff. The first thing you should do is choose a foreperson who will preside over your deliberations. The four persons should see to it that your discussions are carried on in an organized way and that everyone has a fair chance to be heard. It is also the four persons job to sign and date the verdict form when all of you have agreed on a verdict and to bring the verdict form back to the courtroom when you return. During deliberations, jurors must communicate about the case only with one another and only when all the jurors are present in the jury room. If a juror goes to the restroom, the deliberation should stop until the juror returns. You are not to communicate with any person outside the jury about this case. Until you have reached a verdict, you must not talk about this case in person or through the telephone, writing, or electronic communication, such as a blog, Twitter, email, text message, or any other means. Do not contact anyone to assist you during deliberations. These communications rules apply until I discharge you at the end of the case. If you become aware of any violation of these instructions or any other instruction I have given in this case, you must tell me by giving a note to the bailiff. Many of you may have cell phones, tablets, laptops, or other electronic devices here in the courtroom. The rules do not allow you to bring your phones or any of those types of electronic devices into the jury room during deliberations kind of leave those devices with the bailiff while you deliberate. If you need to communicate with me, send a note through the bailiff. If you have voted, do not disclose the actual vote in the note. If you have a question, I will talk with the attorneys before I answer, so it may take some time. You may continue your deliberations while you wait for my answer. I will answer any questions, if I can, in writing or orally here in open court. During the trial, items were received into evidence as exhibits. You may examine whatever exhibits you think will help you in your deliberations. 
These exhibits will be sent into the jury room with you when you begin to deliberate. If you wish to use the audio headphones provided in the courtroom, please request that in writing. In closing, let me remind you that it is important that you follow the law spelled out in these instructions in deciding your verdict. There are no other laws that apply to this case. Even if you do not like the laws that must be applied, you must use them. For more than two centuries, we have lived by the Constitution and the law. No juror has the right to violate rules we all share. All right, so you'll be taking your instructions back uh, with you. Also, a short instruction in regards to your notes. You may also take any notes that you took during this trial back to the deliberation room. As previously instructed, your notes are a tool to aid your memory. You should not compare your notes with those of other jurors in determining the content of any testimony or in evaluating the importance of any evidence. Notes are for the note taker's personal use in refreshing his or her recollection of the evidence. They are not evidence, and above all, your memory should be your greatest asset in your recollection of the evidence. All right, at this time, I need to discharge the alternate jurors. We have two alternate jurors who will not be going back to deliberate uh, in the jury room. And the alternate jurors are Ms. Crump, you are an alternate juror, and Ms. Gilliard, uh, Gil is it Gilliard? Ms. Gilliard, you are also an alternate juror, okay? I want to thank you very much for your service. You have been extremely dedicated, and um, I know that you've sat here for uh, the two weeks and you're not going back to the jury room, but it wasn't all for nothing. We appreciate all your time and efforts in regards to this case. The bailiff is gonna escort you back to the jury room so you can gather any personal belongings and then you'll be excused out the back door, okay? You can leave anything that you have right there on your chair, uh, any notes or uh, the jury instructions. All right, thank you both very much. Okay, once the deputy has returned to tell me that uh, they are out of the jury room, then uh, you will be uh, going back to begin your deliberations, okay? Um, lunch is back there waiting for you, and uh, so that will be provided for you. And so uh, the timing of your deliberations, of course, is now completely up to you, okay? So we'll just wait just a moment for the bailiff to return. All right. Okay. The deputy will now take you back so that you can uh, begin your deliberations. Yeah, you need to gather the phone. Yes, okay, the jury's back in the jury room and the door is closed. The deputy's gathering their phones at this time. And uh, so for the record, uh, uh, any objection to the jury instructions as read from the defense? No, Your Honor. Any objection to the jury instructions as read? No, sir. Thank you. All right, and uh, I'm gonna ask one uh, member of each council team to come up, take a look at the exhibits before we send them back. I wanna get on the record that there's no objection uh, to uh, the exhibits that are going back. I know you've made other objections during the, 
uh, course of the trial, but I want to make sure that uh, you view those and uh, and also the verdict form. And then we'll take those back to the jury. Uh, the attorneys uh, can leave their cell phone numbers with Madam Clerk. OK, and then uh, if we hear from the jury, either with a verdict or with a question or otherwise, then we will uh, notify you. But uh, please don't go far so that we can gather back in the courtroom promptly. OK, so uh, if uh, two of the attorneys can come on up and take a look at the exhibit so that we can send those back to the jury along with the verdict form. Two of us on? Just one. That's all that's necessary. Ms. Kaplan. May I be permitted at this time to introduce a couple items as court exhibits for the record. I have the Dolce transcript, the emails, the wire call transcripts, and the closing PowerPoint. I'd like to have those marked as court exhibits. Okay, so as and so exhibits that are just are not going back to the jury, just as court exhibits for yes, the sir, file. Based on your prior rulings, they're not to be used, but I want to All right, we'll put those exhibits. into the file. And, um, and Madam Clerk, would those be numbered or lettered or how? I'll be numbering those. Um, and they'll be numbered court exhibits for one. Okay. All right. So court's exhibit, and those will be numbered, and we'll take special precautions to make sure that those don't go back to the jury. Okay. All right. Who's going to take a look at the exhibits for the state? Okay. And Mr. DeCoste, are you for the defense? Yes, sir. All right. Then I want to get that on the record, please. Ms. Kaplan, you're satisfied with the exhibits going back to the jury? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. 